R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 1, Chapters 26 through 31. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 26, On a Train en Route to Richmond. Dressed in civilian clothes and silk hat, Lee departed from Arlington on the morning of April 22, never to enter its friendly portals again. Driving to Alexandria, he joined Judge Robertson, checked his trunk, and, with somber face, climbed aboard the train of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, bound for Gordonsville, whence he was to travel via the Virginia Central to Richmond. The first stage of his journey took him through a rolling countryside. Soon the Blue Ridge Mountains were faintly visible to the west, guarding the Shenandoah Valley. Every few miles the train would stop at some station where an anxious crowd waited for the newspapers and inquired whether Virginia had yet been invaded. Well it was for him, as he gazed out of the window, that he did not know what the names of these simple places were soon to signify to him, or how many of those who looked up at him from the platforms were to die at his word. Else even his resolute heart might have grown faint. Here was Manassas Junction, where passengers who had come down the Manassas Gap Railroad took the train. Three months to the very day was to see the station and the road filled with bleeding men, and all the quiet fields covered with the victims and the debris of a great battle. Seventeen months and a little more were to find him close by, after one of the greatest of his victories. Did any of his fellow passengers talk of crossing Thoroughfare Gap, of visiting Centerville, of passing Groveton Heights? The words were well-nigh meaningless to him, if they were uttered, but ere long they were to be forever associated with his name. Soon he was at Bristow Station, in the very railway cut from which two of his brigades were to be repulsed bloodily one autumn day in 1863. Catlett Station, the conductor called Catlett Station, where Jeb Stewart was to capture the enemy's headquarters in a midnight hour of groping, Warrenton Junction next, how many times he was to look at its name on his map. Rappahannock Bridge that was to be the scene of a dark tragedy for some of his soldiers, Fleetwood Hill and Brandy Station, at the mention of which every reader of history was to hear a bugle call, Culpepper, future objective of many of his marches, all these he passed. Clark's Mountain rose in the distance, and he crossed Rapidan River, down which were Raccoon Ford, Germana, Ely's Ford. Presently he was at Orange Courthouse, whence two roads lead eastward into the tangled country that the natives rightly had styled the wilderness. He changed cars at Gordonville, for the protection of which so many of his plans were later to be shaped, then he came down the Virginia Central Railroad, that was for many months to hold his army together. Trevilian Station, Louisa, Fredericks Hall, Beaver Dam, all of them were to become a part of his biography. With much blowing of the whistle and grinding of the brakes, he reached Hanover Junction, where the Virginia Central crossed the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad. The village had been unknown to fame, but it was to become, after Richmond, the chief object of his care for many anxious seasons. At Orange and at Louisa he had to go to the rear of the car and bow to the crowds that insistently called for him. For the rest of the long journey he observed and pondered. Was he prepared for what lay ahead in that country that the fate seemed to spread out before him, as if to show him its simple beauty and peace, ere he saw it ruined by war? No, he was not prepared no man could be. But did he possess the qualities that would make it possible for him to equip himself for leadership? He was then fifty-four years of age and stood five feet eleven inches in height, weighing slightly less than one hundred and seventy pounds. In physique he was sound, without a blemish on his body. In the whole of his previous life he had suffered only one recorded illness and that had not been severe. Without having the bulging muscles of bovine strength, he was possessed of great powers of endurance, as he had demonstrated that night on the pedregal in front of Paderna. Only at the end of the long-continued strain of the days preceding the attack on Chapultepec had his body failed him, and then only for a few hours. When he was past forty, he had competed with his sons in high jumps at Arlington. He had skated and danced and had been an excellent swimmer. His vision and teeth were fine, his hearing was unimpaired, and his voice, which was of the lower middle register, was rich and resonant. Few men were the inheritors of a stronger nervous system.
From the most strenuous efforts he could relax almost instantly, and if he sat down unoccupied, even in a church, he had to be on his guard lest he dropped quickly asleep. In appearance, one fellow traveler, who saw him that April day, considered Lee the noblest-looking man I had ever gazed upon, handsome beyond all men I had ever seen. His fine large head, which had a circumference of twenty-three and one-half inches, was broadly rounded, with prominent brows and wide temples, and was set on a short, strong neck. His hair was black, with a sprinkle of gray, his short mustache was wholly black. Brown eyes that seemed black in dim light and a slightly florid complexion gave warmth and color to his grave face. His mouth was wide and well arched. His lips were thin. A massive torso rose above narrow hips, and his large hands were in contrast to very small feet. Sitting behind a desk, or on a horse, his shoulders, neck, and hands made him appear a larger man than he actually was. His finest appearance was when mounted, for he was an admirable rider, with the flat legs of the ideal cavalryman, and he always used the dragoon seat, with long stirrups. His manners accorded with his person. In 1861, as always, he was the same in his bearing to men of every station, courteous, simple, and without pretense. Of objective mind, free of any suggestion of self-consciousness, he was considerate in his dealings with others, and of never-failing tact. He made friends readily and held them steadfastly. Close relations never lowered him in the esteem of his associates. He was clean-minded and frank with his friends and confided in them more freely than has been supposed. Always he was unselfish, talked little of himself, and was in no sense egotistical. Although he was slow to take offense and was not quick to wrath, his temper was strong. Except when he was sick, he rarely broke the bounds of self-mastery for more than a moment. Then he was best left alone. In all that has been recorded of him prior to 1861, the only instance in which he is reported to have let his indignation overcome his self-control was when he told Charles Anderson of the threat of the Texas commissioners to refuse him transportation to the coast unless he resigned from the United States Army and accepted a Confederate commission. The company of women, especially of pretty women, he preferred to that of men. In the presence of the other sex, he displayed a gracious, and sometimes a breezy gallantry, but no suggestion of a scandal, no hint of over-intimacy, was ever linked with his name. His conversation with his younger female friends was lively, with many touches of teasing and with an occasional mild pun, but it was not witty. He had a good sense of humor, which his dignity rarely permitted him to exhibit in laughter. Those who observed him closely, in the midst of comical incidents, believed that he laughed inwardly. The bitter strife that lay ahead was to check even these occasional evidences of mirth, as if the memory of the dead came to him just at the instant he had been tempted to smile at the narration of some hilarious story. In dealing with children his manners were at their finest. For them he always had a smile, no matter where he met them, and without indulging in foolish talk or grimaces, he won their confidence almost invariably. There is only one case of record, and that after the war, when a child would not talk confidently with him on first acquaintance. The farther he was from his own offspring, and the longer the separation, the more he craved the company of other children. His manners reflected his spiritual life. It has been in vain that some of his biographers have asked if his calm dignity did not cover some deep spiritual conflict. It was not so. His was a simple soul, humble, transparent, and believing. Increasingly through the years prior to that historic railway journey to Richmond, religion had become a part of his very being. So far as may be judged from his letters, he had not passed through a single period of doubt as to the existence of a personal God. The religious controversies of his mature years never touched him. Creeds meant little to him. Reading daily his Bible and his prayer book, spending much time on his knees, he believed in a God who, in his wisdom, sent blessings beyond man's deserts and visited him, on occasion, with hardships and disaster for the chastening of the rebellious heart of the ungrateful and the forgetful. As Robert E. Lee viewed it, on the eve of his plunge into the bloody tragedy of a war among brothers, life was only a preparation for eternity. Whatever befell the faithful was the will of God, and whatever God willed was best. In every disaster, he was to stand firm in the faith that it was sent by God for reasons that man could not see. The application of this faith was as simple as its content. Self-denial and self-control were the supreme rule of life. 
It was the basis of his code of conduct. He loved good food, fried chicken, game, barbecued shoat, roast beef, but he was ready to eat thankfully the hardest fare of the field. In the confused councils he was doomed to share, he bore the contention of braggarts and swaggerers with self-control because it was his duty as a soldier to be patient and his obligation as a Christian to be humble. In dealing with alcoholic beverages, his habits were abstemious lest he endanger his self-mastery. He had built up, in this way, a dislike for tobacco, which he never used, and a hatred for whiskey. I think it better to avoid it altogether, as you do, he had written one of his sons, with reference to strong drink, as its temperate use is so difficult. Even wine he drank rarely and in small quantities. His ideals had their embodiment, for unconsciously he was a hero worshipper. He viewed his father not as light horse Harry was in the tragic years of his speculation, but as he might have been if the promise of his revolutionary record had been fulfilled. Above his father and every other man he had always placed Washington. The father of his country was no mere historical figure to him, great but impersonal and indistinct. Through Lee's long years of association with Mr. Custis, who knew Washington better than did any man alive in 1850, Washington was as real to him as if the majestic Virginian had stepped down nightly from the canvas at Arlington and had talked reminiscently with the family about the birth of an earlier revolution. Daily, for almost thirty years, whenever Lee had been at home, his environment had been a constant suggestion of the same ideal. He had come to view duty as Washington did, to act as he thought Washington would, and even, perhaps, to emulate the grave, self-contained courtesy of the great American rebel. The modesty of his nature doubtless kept Lee now from drawing the very obvious analogy between his situation and that of Washington in 1775, but the influence and the ideal were deep in his soul. He would not have shaped such a question, even in his own mind, but those who knew him as the inheritor of the Mount Vernon tradition must have asked if he was destined to be the Washington of the South's War for Independence. In intellect he was of an even higher order than had been demonstrated in his record of 32 years of army service without a single failure to his discredit. His mind was mathematical and his imagination that, and only that, of an engineer. The best of his results always were attained when originality and initiative could be employed. Routine office duties bored him. Although a specialist in his work and in his reading, his culture was wider than that of most soldiers. Well-grounded in Greek and in Latin, he kept some of the spirit of the classics when he had forgotten the texts. French, which he had mastered when he was in his first full vigor of mind, remained longer with him than the language of the antique world. For Spanish, he had an enthusiasm born of a belief in its utility. Of some phases of American history, and particularly of those in which his family had figured, he had a measure of precise knowledge. Fiction he avoided as an intellectual narcotic, but poetry he enjoyed and tenaciously remembered. His principal reading, never wide, was chiefly of the newspapers, to which he looked for that part of his information of public affairs not supplied by his conversation. There was music in his family, and a real, if undiscriminating, love of art. Essentially an out-of-doors man, the pictures he enjoyed most were those of nature's own painting, and his most understanding affection was for her creatures, horses, dogs, cats even. As other men might admire a great portrait, he delighted to look at a sunset or at a garden. Birds were a particular care to him. His own contribution to physical beauty was through the promotion of orderliness and in the planting of trees. Prolonged travel had been his lot as an army officer, in New England, along the whole of the South Atlantic seaboard, and on the frontier, but he had been in no foreign land except Mexico. In his journeyings he was extremely sensitive to the natural charm of a picturesque country and interested in the fertility of farmlands, but he never lingered to admire them if delay would interfere with the precision of his schedule. Outside his profession his chief interests were not cultural but agricultural and social. The ideal life, had he been able to fashion it, would have been to entertain or to visit pleasant people and friendly kinfolk while riding daily over a small plantation that was tilled by white men and was improving in value and in appearance. As for society, he learned more from men than from books. His dignity cloaked no diffidence. The company of humans he sought and loved, unwearied by small talk and unvaryingly patient with dull minds.
all manner of acquaintances were his generals, professors, planters, politicians, engineers, laborers, for his life in isolated forts and at frontier stations had been relieved by assignments to the centers of thought and of political action. In meeting and remembering new acquaintances he had a singularly developed and highly useful memory for names. Men had been the raw material of his work as an engineer and as an administrator. Alike to giving and to taking orders he had long been disciplined. His superiors, as a rule, had been trained, his laborers had often been inexperienced and awkward. He had always been able to satisfy, and more than satisfy, the officers to whom he was responsible, while getting much toil from those in his charge. His methods were systematic. Essentially of a scientific mind, he would first study his problem exhaustively. Once he had found what he deemed the best solution within the money and resources at his disposal, he would start at the rough beginnings, with the simple tools at his command. The prospect of organizing a long and difficult project had no terrors for a man who had worked at Cockspur Island, at the Des Moines Rapids, and at Sollers Point. Rapid in his work, and happily free of any trace of laziness, he was as mindful of detail as he was resourceful in design. In born thrift, his mother's thrift, strengthened by the discipline of his youth, made him economical in the public service, accurate in accounting, and prompt in report. Rarely ahead he enjoyed the luxury of more than one assistant, so frequently had he carried the whole burden on his own shoulders that it was second nature to make his decisions alone, and alone to direct the execution of his plans. With pride in his profession, he had all the engineer's zest for action and a profound aversion for delay. His delight was in getting results, and results were Virginia's instant need with the clouds of war blowing fast toward the capital whither Lee's train was carrying him. After the first duty of helping to organize an army, in what capacity he did not yet know, Lee had to anticipate a bloody and a bitter war. What did he know of the grisly art he would have to apply? In those two unchanging fundamentals of military service, discipline and cooperation, Robert E. Lee had received the precise training of a professional soldier. Obedience to orders was part of his religion. Adverse decisions on his acts he had schooled himself to accept in precisely the same spirit as approval. He could elicit the support of his superiors without flattery, and in the few instances where he had ever had subordinates, he had won their allegiance without threats. He was a diplomat among engineers. Fully qualified to deal with the politician in executive office, he was suspicious of him in the field or in the forum, and none too confident of his sagacity in legislation, though he was as meticulous as his great model, Washington, in subordinating himself, at all times and in all things, to civil authority. His dealings with his brother officers had never been darkened by scheming or marred by jealousy. Of much that West Point taught and of all that it failed to inculcate, his observation had been close and personal. A knowledge of the capacity of some of his prospective opponents had been gained by his service at the academy, in Mexico, and in Texas. His tedious attendance upon dull courts martial had not been time wasted, for there he had seen the rivalries, the animosities, and the occasional demoralization of camp life uncovered. Even the pillow court of inquiry had been a useful part of his military education, for it had shown him how selfish political ambitions could rive an army in the field. Familiarity with the history of war, another fundamental of the training of a leader, was his in limited measure. The American revolutionary campaigns he had surveyed carefully. His reading of Light Horse Harry's memoirs had been emulous and detailed. Napoleon was the great captain whose battles he had most carefully followed from Jomini and from such other books as were available. The operations in Italy, the descent on Egypt, and the Russian campaign he must have known with thoroughness. To the Crimean War he had devoted at least casual study. With Hannibal and with Julius Caesar he was not wholly unacquainted. From these masters of war, and most of all from General Winfield Scott, he had learned the theory of strategy, and had learned it well. He had participated, too, in nearly all the strategical preparation of the most successful series of battles ever fought prior to 1861 by an American army. The strategy he had seen Scott apply had primarily been that of flank attack, based on careful reconnaissance and, where possible, on surprise. Cerro Gordo and Paderna, the two battles which were fought on the basis of Lee's own study of the ground, seemed to have meant more in shaping his views of strategy than all his reading.
Chapultepec, also, had made a deep impression on him and perhaps suggested the final assault at Gettysburg. The strategical function of the high command he had learned from those same battles in Mexico. That function, as he saw it, was to develop the lines of communication, to direct the reconnaissance, to ascertain the precise position of the enemy, and then to bring all the combatant units into position at the proper time and to the best advantage. In Mexico, Scott had never tried to handle his troops in action. He had left this to the divisional commanders, Lee's instinct was to do the same thing. But if Lee was, in the spring of 1861, a well-schooled theoretical strategist, whose interest lay in that field of war, Scott's methods and his own lack of opportunity had given him a very limited knowledge of tactics. He was adept enough, of course, in the drill and maneuvers of the cadet battalion at West Point, but of larger tactical experience he had little. Twenty-six of his thirty-two years in the army had been spent on the staff, and only six in the line. Of these six years, something less than three had been passed with troops. At no time had he commanded more than three hundred men in the field, and even that number simply for one brief uneventful scout through a desert. Since he had left West Point, he had never served with infantry or with artillery, except in the battery at Vera Cruz. Thanks, however, to the advantages that Scott had afforded him during the campaign from Vera Cruz to Mexico City, he had far more than the staff officer's approach to the duties that awaited him in excited Richmond. In reconnaissance, his experience had been sufficient to develop great aptitude. One of the most compelling commandments of his military decalogue was to examine in person, fully and carefully, the ground of advance and anticipated action. He was an excellent topographer and not without training as an intelligence officer. Those anxious summer days spent at Puebla in 1847, when he had questioned travelers regarding the approaches to Santa Ana's capital, were to yield him many a dividend of advantage in the Virginia campaigns. He had seen something of what sea power meant, and he had watched observantly as Scott had made the hard calculation of the chances the army must take when it prepared to abandon its line of communications and to subsist on the country through which it was to advance. Fortification, as an engineer, he knew thoroughly. Nearly every contemporary form of coast defense he had studied, and in the location and design of some types he was as well trained as any American soldier. The nascent art of field fortification he had examined in Mexico, but always from the standpoint of the attack. Such was the positive equipment of Robert E. Lee at the beginning of the war between the states. It was, on the whole, the best equipment with which any soldier entered the struggle, for the capable leaders of Scott's divisions of 1847 were then either dead or too infirm for action, and few of the brigadiers of the Mexican campaigns had displayed special ability. The absence of any retirement law for their seniors had kept most of the colonels of 18461848 from becoming general officers before they had passed the age when they could adapt themselves to the intricate problems of a war in the United States. Admirable as was the training of Lee, it was not complete. He had scant knowledge of militia and little experience with hastily trained volunteers, wide as was his acquaintance with inexpert civilian labor. Only the regular soldier did he know well. Again, from the narrowness of his subordinate command, there was danger that his view would be microscopic. In the third place, all his battle experience had been on the offensive, though the situation and the comparative weakness of the South were to compel it to hold to a defensive in the larger sense of the word. Furthermore, having labored so long on detached projects, he was disposed to do work that could have been passed on to others. Most of all was he lacking in any detailed knowledge of the service of supply. Belonging to the elite corps of the army, he had never performed lengthy duty as quartermaster or as commissary, and he had not sought any such detail for the sake of promotion as his friend Joe Johnston had. Nor had he and most of the other Confederate leaders been reared in a society that gave them a background for this homely but essential part of the work of a successful commanding general. Industry, with a few exceptions, had not attracted the best brains of the South. In plantation life, while provision had to be made for clothing and feeding hundreds, this had been the task overseers, and overseers were not apt to be chosen to lead armies. With Lee's excellent training in some directions set down in one column and his lack of equipment in some particulars placed opposite it, any person who knew him intimately would have said that the man who was now approaching Richmond would show himself a fine strategist, though he might perhaps be a bit theoretical, a popular leader though not a facile tactician, in short, an excellent man to organize an army, 
to make reconnaissance and to plan battles, but an unknown quantity in handling. Troops in Action What surprises one who studies the military education of Lee is the entire absence of anything to forecast his great skill in troop movements. His experience in logistics had been confined to what he observed in Mexico, where no railroad existed, coupled with the little he had learned during the Harper's Ferry insurrection. Yet from the hour he had responsibility for using the railroads to effect rapid concentration, he employed them as if he had spent his life in practicing how to bring great bodies of men to a desired point at a predetermined moment. All these were the abstract considerations that might have been argued in the case of any soldier whose background was known. There remained the basic, if less tangible, factor of temperament. He was a gentleman in every impulse, was he too much a gentleman for the dirty business of war? Was there enough of steel in his soul? That respect for civil authority, would it tie his hands in a revolution? Feeling that his duty was performed when he had obeyed his orders and had done his utmost, would he fight for his opinions? Would he escape the subordinate complex which is all too familiar in war? If the Southern cause ever depended on him and on him alone, was there in him the stuff of which military dictators are made? If he thought at all of these things, as his train rolled down to the valley of the Chickahominy, it must have been in the humble conviction that he was not equal to the task that lay ahead, a task of which he was one of the few Southern men to realize the full magnitude. Far better than the throngs that cheered the new Palmetto flag, he knew the might and the prestige of the old standard that had been hauled down. The crowds that filled the stations along his route may have been talking of easy victories and early independence, but he had measured the strength and determination of the North, and he foresaw a bloody test, a long war, a doubtful issue. The passengers on the train began to stir. Peak's turnout was passed, Atlee's was reached. To the southeast was a little village bearing the unpretending name of Mechanicsville and beyond that a sleepy crossroads called Cold Harbor. Richmond was close now, Richmond that was soon to be a torch and a trumpet. It had been a quiet city of 37,000 people when madness had seized the country, a place of peace and pleasantness. John Smith had come there at Whitsuntide in the year when Jamestown had been settled, a fort had been erected at the Falls of the James before the massacre of 1622, slowly through the 18th century it had been built up until, in 1779, it had become the capital of the Commonwealth, in succession to Williamsburg. On picturesque hills that followed a wide bend in the river, successful merchants had reared ample homes. Flour that was sent across the line to South America had early been stenciled with the city's name, a capital that Jefferson himself had modeled after an old Roman temple at Nîmes had been erected on the finest eminence. A generation later a canal had been started that was to link Richmond with the headwaters of the Ohio and rescue for Virginia the trade of the old Northwest that New York was diverting through the Erie. John Marshall had lived in Richmond and had been buried there, Edgar Allan Poe had called it home. To its large hotels the wealthy planters had come, from its platforms Clay, Webster, Thackeray, and Dickens had spoken. Wealthy for the time, with strong banks, varied manufactories, profitable shipping, and ample railroad connections with almost every part of the state, boasting a state arsenal and a large rolling mill, Richmond was the heart of Virginia, financially and economically. Most of all was she rich in her people. None of them had a mighty fortune, few of them were very poor, but nearly all of them had lived long in the town and had the homogeneity not less of understanding than of blood. Together they rejoiced, as one they labored. Noblesse oblige was written larger in the civic code than any ordinance the common hall ever drafted. As Whigs and as Democrats, as Union men and secessionists, the voters had divided often and violently, but always for their city's honor they had been a unit. Fire and pestilence and the gray adversity that had followed flush times had left them like-minded. Save for long-forgotten Indian fights and a brush with the British, when Arnold had captured the place in 1781, Richmond had never heard the clash of combat, but now that the evil day was come she had cast her lot wholeheartedly with the South. All that she had symbolized in peace was to be forgotten in the battles that were to be waged for her. Alarms were to bewilder her, the first slaughter was to stun her, but soon she was to show the staunchness of her soul. She had meant little in the life of the gentleman who sat erect in his silk hat as the train pulled into the station, but from the moment the conductor cried, all out for Richmond, the safety of that city was to be the supreme care of the military life of Robert E. Lee. Chapter 27, Virginia Looks to Lee.
from the train shed at 17th and Broad Streets, on the afternoon of April 22, 1861, Colonel Lee made his way to a carriage and rode through Richmond Streets to the Spotswood Hotel at the southeast corner of 8th and Main Streets, where he took a room. The conversation he overheard, as he walked through the lobby and as he ate his supper, was all of defense against invasion, of preparation, and of speedy alliance with the Southern Confederacy. The day before, while the ministers had been dismissing their anxious, prayerful congregations, the tocsin had been sounded from the guardhouse in the Capitol Square, and word had quickly spread that the Pawnee, a federal warship, was steaming up James River to bombard the unprotected city. The volunteer companies had rushed to arms, the Fayette artillery had galloped with its field guns to an eminence overlooking the stream, the governor himself had gone to the waterfront, the soldiery had lined the riverbank, old men had taken down their fouling pieces, and curious, unarmed thousands had hurried to the hilltops to watch for the coming of the sloop. She had not appeared, though the martial waiting had been continued until nightfall. Then Richmond had been told that the rumor had originated in a misreading of telegrams. The excitement of this first of Richmond's many war scares had not died away when Lee arrived. The town was buzzing, also, over the arrival of Alexander H. Stevens, vice president, a special commissioner from the Confederate States of America to the Commonwealth of Virginia, with letters of credence, authorizing him to negotiate of and concerning all matters and subjects interesting to both republics. All secessionists welcomed Mr. Stevens and advocated a speedy union of Virginia with the other southern states. Most Whigs, now that war was upon them, favored the same course. Virginia, as they saw it, could not remain neutral. Would the convention, which had been sitting in secret session, display the same spirit and vote Virginia into the Confederacy, pending final action by the people on the Ordinance of Secession? In the hotels and in the streets every man was a constitutional lawyer as he debated this question and discussed Stevens's mission. Lee's military instinct told him that the crowd was right, Virginia alone could not resist. If there must be war, there must be alliance with the South. He did not mingle with the noisy debaters, however. Instead, he hastened to the Capitol, where he met Virginia's governor. John Letcher was then 58, a bald-headed, florid, bottle-nosed lawyer from Rockbridge County in the Shenandoah Valley. Not a brilliant man, he was a level-headed conservative Democrat, and he had refused to endorse secession until Lincoln had called for troops. Lee was to see much of Letcher during the next few months and he was to profit by Letcher's integrity, his determination, his common sense, and his familiarity with the mind of the Virginia people. Letcher did not flatter himself that every politician was a soldier. During that tempestuous April week, he was one of the few public men who did not have on his tongue the very plan by which victory could be achieved, quickly and surely. The governor had an explanation to make, an explanation to make and a question to ask. The state convention, he said, had provided by an ordinance of April 19 for the appointment of a commander of the military and naval forces of Virginia with the rank of major general and with authority to direct the organization and operations of the troops under the governor's constitutional control. The advisory council had recommended Lee for this post. Letcher had formally tendered it to him on April 21 and had sent a messenger, whom Lee had probably passed on the road. Would Lee accept the office created by the convention? That was the question Letcher put, so directly and with so little dramatic touch, that neither the language of his tender nor of Lee's reply has been preserved. Lee's answer had been shaped by the very reasons that had led him to resign from the army. He felt that his first allegiance was to Virginia. When he had said he would unsheath his sword only in her defense, that was equivalent to saying that when she called, he would respond. There was, consequently, no hesitation now, in a few brief words he accepted the task of defending his native state. Doubtless he told the governor that he had not resigned in the expectation or in the desire of further military service, and he probably added that he wished an abler man had been found for the task Virginia assigned. That was all. Before the convention adjourned its night session Lee's name was sent in by Governor Letcher for confirmation, with a simple note that Lee had determined to resign from the United States Army before the convention had created the office to which Lee was nominated. The convention at once and unanimously approved the choice, word that Lee would take command was telegraphed to Norfolk, then considered the most threatened point in the state, and the weary new general retired to his bed in the Spotswood Hotel with a greater burden than he had ever borne.
The next morning, April 23, Lee opened a temporary office either in the Richmond Post Office or in the Old State General Court Building. Without an adjutant or even a clerk, he drafted his General Order No. 1 announcing that he had assumed command and Governor Letcher made a statement to the same effect. Before Lee was able to do much more, a committee from the convention waited on him to escort him to the Capitol, where he was to receive formal notice of his appointment. Accompanied by four members of the convention, Marmaduke Johnson of Richmond, P. C. Johnston, representing Lee and Scott Counties, W. T. Sutherland of Danville, and John Critcher of his own native county of Westmoreland, Lee climbed the hill shortly before noon and entered the Capitol, where the convention was sitting behind closed doors. When he arrived some necessary motions were under discussion on the floor, and there was a brief delay in the rotunda. Lee's mind was running ahead to the exactions of the hour and to the necessities of united action by all the southern states. Virginia came first in his devotion, but he saw plainly that neither her defense nor the triumph of her cause could be assured unless the South halted all centrifugal tendencies and remained one republic. In this thought, as he waited, Lee looked up at the ivory-tinted statue of his great hero, Washington, a marble that exhibits the perfect poise and all the high determination of an early revolutionary, and he said aloud, I hope we have seen the last of secession. Some, at least, of those who stood around him did not understand what he meant. The doors were opened. Lee entered on the arm of Marmaduke Johnson. A crowded room greeted his eye, the same room in which his father, pleading vainly against the Virginia resolutions of 1798, had affirmed that he would share the calamities he could not prevent. The convention rose to receive him. On the speaker's platform stood the president of the convention, John Janney. To his right was the emaciated, unhealthy figure of Vice President Stevens, his eyes shining, his thin lips taut. Beyond him was Governor Letcher. On the left of Janney was Judge John J. Allen, president both of the Court of Appeals and of the Governor's Advisory Council. By his side were the other two members of the council, Colonel Francis H. Smith, superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute, and a keen-eyed man with a great dome of a head and pleasant composure of countenance, Matthew Fontaine Maury, the oceanographer who had resigned his post at the Naval Observatory in Washington to share in the defense of his native Virginia. This much Lee observed at first glance. Then, when they were three short paces within the entrance, Johnson announced, Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you, and to the convention, Major General Lee. Lee halted. The members of the convention took their seats again. President Janney remained standing and, a moment later, addressed Lee in full and rounded periods. Major General Lee, he said solemnly, in the name of the people of your native state, here represented, I bid you a cordial and heartfelt welcome to this hall, in which we may almost yet hear the echo of the voices of the statesmen, the soldiers and sages of bygone days, who have borne your name and whose blood now flows in your veins. We met in the month of February last, charged with the solemn duty of protecting the rights, the honor and the interests of the people of this commonwealth. We differed for a time as to the best means of accomplishing that object, but there never was, at any moment, a shade of difference amongst us as to the great object itself, and now, Virginia having taken her position, as far as the power of this convention extends, we stand animated by one impulse, governed by one desire and one determination, and that is that she shall be defended, and that no spot of her soil shall be polluted by the foot of an invader. When the necessity became apparent of having a leader for our forces, all hearts and all eyes, by the impulse of an instinct which is a surer guide than reason itself, turned to the old county of Westmoreland. We knew how prolific she had been in other days of heroes and statesmen. We knew she had given birth to the father of his country, to Richard Henry Lee, to Monroe, and last, though not least, to your own gallant father, and knew well, by your own deeds, that her productive power yet exhausted. Sir, we watched with the most profound and intense interest the triumphal march of the army led by General Scott, to which you were attached, from Veracruz to the capital of Mexico, we read of the sanguinary conflicts and the blood-stained fields, in all of which victory perched upon our own banners, we knew of the unfading luster that was shed upon the American arms by that campaign, and we know, also, what your modesty has always disclaimed, that no small share of the glory of those achievements was due to your valor and your military genius. Sir, one of the proudest recollections of my life will be the honor that I yesterday had of submitting to this body the confirmation of the nomination made by the governor of this state, of you as commander-in-chief of the military and naval forces of this commonwealth. 
I rose to put the question, and when I asked if this body would advise and consent to that appointment, there rushed from the hearts to the tongues of all the members an affirmative response that told with an emphasis that could leave no doubt of the feeling whence it emanated. I put the negative of the question for form's sake, but there was an unbroken silence. Sir, we have, by this unanimous vote, expressed our conviction that you are at this day, among the living citizens of Virginia, first in war. We pray God most fervently that you may so conduct the operations committed to your charge, that it will soon be said of you, that you are first in peace, and when that time comes you will have earned the still prouder distinction of being first in the hearts of your countrymen. I will close with one more remark. When the father of his country made his last will and testament, he gave his swords to his nephews with an injunction that they should never be drawn from their scabbards, except in self-defense, or in defense of the rights and liberties of their country, and that, if drawn for the latter purpose, they should fall with them in their hands, rather than relinquish them. Yesterday, your mother, Virginia, placed her sword in your hand upon the implied condition that we know you will keep to the letter and in spirit, that you will draw it only in her defense, and that you will fall with it in your hand rather than that the object for which it was placed there shall fail. Lee had anticipated no such welcome as this and must have been embarrassed by Jenny's praise. He had never made a speech in his life, but he saw that he was expected to reply and he answered, slowly and distinctly, Mr. President and gentlemen of the convention, profoundly impressed with the solemnity of the occasion, for which I must say I was not prepared, I accept the position assigned me by your partiality. I would have much preferred had your choice fallen on an abler man. Trusting in Almighty God, an approving conscience, and the aid of my fellow citizens, I devote myself to the service of my native state, in whose behalf alone will I ever again draw my sword. The chair was thereupon vacated, and the members gathered about him, to congratulate him and to voice their confidence in him. His previous reputation and his fine appearance made a most favorable impression upon them. Said Stevens, all the force which personal appearance could add to the power and impressiveness of words was imparted by his manly form and the great dignity as well as grace in his every action and movement. All these, combined, sent home to the breast of every one the conviction that he was thoroughly impressed himself with the full consciousness of the immense responsibility he had assumed. Wrote Jubal A. Early, member from Franklin and later one of Lee's corps commanders, those who witnessed his appearance before the convention, saw his manly bearing, and heard the few grave, dignified and impressive words with which he consecrated himself and his sword to the cause of his native state, can never forget that scene. All felt at once that we had a leader worthy of the state and the cause. As soon as the news of Lee's appointment and acceptance reached the larger public, it aroused high enthusiasm and evoked much praise. The Richmond Inquirer quoted with satisfaction a report that General Winfield Scott had said he had rather have received the resignation of every general other than that of Lee. A more heroic Christian, noble soldier and gentleman, said the Richmond Dispatch, could not be found. And again, of him it was said before his appointment, and of him it may be well said, no man is superior and all that constitutes the soldier and the gentleman, no man more worthy to head our forces and lead our army. There is no one who would command more of the confidence of the people of Virginia than this distinguished officer, and no one under whom the volunteers and militia would more gladly rally. His reputation, his acknowledged ability, his chivalric character, his probity, honor, and, may we add to his eternal praise, his Christian life and conduct make his very name a tower of strength. The Lynchburg Virginian was no less laudatory, we rejoice that this distinguished officer and worthy son of Virginia has withdrawn from Lincoln's army and thrown himself upon the bosom of his native state. It was what we expected of the man. Captain Maury had done likewise, and thus, these two noble men, the very flower of the army and navy of the late United States, respond to the call of their glorious old mother. In different strain, the wife of ex-president Tyler wrote, Colonel Lee, a splendid man every inch of him, is in command of the Virginia forces. He can only lead to victory if this shocking war continues. J. M. Broadus, addressing his brother, John A. Broadus, a minister of high prestige, expressed faith in Lee as a prudent and skillful warrior. I hope he may not precipitate hostilities. Virginia is not ready for a conflict, but she is making herself so as rapidly as possible. In the North, issues overshadowed men. Lee's resignation and his acceptance of the Virginia command attracted little attention for a few weeks.
Then denunciation of the traitor became general, and Lee's personal honor and private conduct were assailed in libelous crescendo. James G. Blaine, looking back upon it, expressed the belief that Lee's assumption of command was a powerful incentive with many to vote against the Union. Some of the very qualities that Lee's admirers saw in him were put to the test within a few hours after he left the convention hall and went to his office to begin work. A message came that Vice President Stevens wished to see him that evening at the Ballard House. Lee called. He found the Confederate emissary perplexed but candid. The Confederacy, Stevens explained, of course desired an immediate military alliance with Virginia and hoped that the Old Dominion would join the other southern states as soon as the voters ratified the Ordinance of Secession. This would involve the control of military operations in Virginia by the Confederate authorities, a manifest necessity of war. The Confederacy had no military rank at the time higher than that of Brigadier General Lee, a Virginia Major General, might find himself under orders of a titular subordinate. The Virginia Convention, Stevens went on, would certainly see that this contingency might arise and, if Lee raised any question of rank, the Convention might refuse to enter into a military agreement. What did Lee propose to do? He understood the situation fully, to use Stevens's own language. With a clear understanding of its bearing upon himself personally, he expressed himself as perfectly satisfied and as being very desirous to have the alliance formed. He stated, in words which produce thorough conviction in my mind of their perfect sincerity, that he did not wish anything connected with himself individually, or his official rank or personal position, to interfere in the slightest degree with the immediate consummation of that measure which he regarded as one of the utmost importance in every possible view of public considerations. With this assurance, Lee bade good evening to Stevens, who prepared to press with renewed confidence for an early alliance. Lee started for the Spotswood Hotel, fully committed to the Confederate cause. His first thought had been of Virginia. He had even resented the belligerent attitude of some of the leaders in the cotton states during the preliminaries of secession. These men, he had believed, were trying to involve the other border states in their quarrel. Now it was different. It was increasingly plain that Virginia would be assailed, in her exposed position she would need the assistance of the South. Virginia's welfare, the very factor that had made him almost hostile to the cotton states, now put him on the side of alliance and common effort. As he tramped back from the Ballard House, through the shadows of the spring night, did he reflect how fast and how far the Southern Revolution had carried him? On Saturday morning he had written to General Scott, to Smith Lee, and to Mrs. Marshall. He had hoped then that he would have to take no part in the quarrel that had forced his resignation. Now it was Wednesday evening and he was a major general in arms against the United States, urging the affiliation of the Commonwealth with the militant new Confederacy. The rapid approach of war had quickly and inexorably revealed which were the deepest loyalties of his soul. Chapter 28 Can Virginia Be Defended? The seven weeks that followed the appointment of Lee to the command of the Virginia forces are the least known of his military career, but certainly among the most interesting. They are little known because the confused events of the period were eclipsed by his conduct of field operations the next year. They are interesting because they represent the solution adopted by a trained military mind for problems that recur in every democratic society that is forced to raise an army from untrained citizens on the outbreak of a war for which there has been no adequate defensive preparation. A close study of what Lee did in Virginia in April-June, 1861, would have prevented some of the blunders of the Spanish War in 1898 and might have simplified the far vaster mobilization of 1917. Lee found himself the military and naval commander, under the governor and convention, of a state of 1,596,652 people, of whom only 1,047,579 were whites. Virginia was the most populous state of the South and the fifth in the Union. Her territory extended from the Atlantic Ocean to the Big Sandy River, within 115 miles of Cincinnati. On the longest axis in the general direction of east and west, Virginia was then 425 miles in width. From the farthest point north, in the Panhandle counties opposite Pittsburgh, the distance directly south to the North Carolina boundary was 300 miles. The gross area was 67,230 square miles, or roughly that of New England. Strategically, Virginia occupied the line of the Potomac and of the Ohio.
She had strong, defensive rivers and mountains, but she was exceedingly vulnerable to attack by a power commanding the sea. The highways of the state were numerous and of every degree of excellence and badness. The railroads, which had a gross mileage of about 1,150 miles, included continuous trackage from Norfolk to Bristol, from Richmond to the Allegheny Mountains, from Alexandria to Lynchburg, from the Potomac River into North Carolina, and a number of shorter lines. That this large state would have to be prepared immediately for defense was apparent to all. She had already committed acts of war, though for self-preservation, and she must accept the consequences. The federal authority had been overthrown everywhere in Virginia except at Lee's old post, Fort Monroe, which had been too powerful for the state's volunteers to assault. Harper's Ferry, familiar to the whole country because of the John Brown raid, had been mistakenly believed by the Virginians to have in its federal arsenal not less than 16,000 modern small arms, badly needed for the defense of the state, together with immensely valuable machinery for the manufacture of muskets and rifles. As soon as the secessionist leaders had been convinced that the convention would withdraw Virginia from the Union, they had determined to capture the Harper's Ferry arsenal, which was held by a small detachment of United States troops. On the night of April 18, Virginia volunteers had descended on the place, only to find that the commander of the guard had received information of their approach and had set fire to the buildings before withdrawing into Maryland. The machinery had escaped the flames, but most of the small arms had been destroyed. The site being as vulnerable as it was important, the Virginia volunteers who occupied Harper's Ferry were more or less in the attitude of holding a wolf by the ears. In another corner of the state, at Norfolk, the United States had maintained a large navy yard where the coming of secession had found ten warships of various classes anchored or undergoing repairs, close to warehouses that contained large stores and much equipment. Norfolk volunteers had promptly sunk some hulks at the mouth of the Elizabeth River in an effort to prevent the escape of the naval vessels. The troops had believed themselves successful in blocking the river, and they had been mustering for the difficult task of storming the navy yard and of boarding the warships, when the sloop Punny, the same craft that alarmed Richmond the next day, had steamed through the obstructions on the night of April 20 and had landed a contingent of about 500 men at the navy yard. They had proceeded to set fire to the buildings and vessels and, about midnight, had left aboard their ship, with the Cumberland in tow. The next day the Virginians had occupied the Navy Yard and had thrown up works to prevent a return of the Federals. On the 22d General Walter Gwynne had taken command at Norfolk on orders from Governor Letcher. Virtually all that was known of the situation, when Lee set to work, was that the fire had burned most of the warships to the water's edge, that the new frigate Merrimack and perhaps one or two others could be raised, that damage to the stores had been slight, and that a great number of unmounted naval guns and some 2,800 barrels of powder had fallen into the hands of the Virginians. These overt acts would certainly be answered, and speedily, by the federal government. It could not permit its power to be flouted at Harper's Ferry and at Norfolk. President Lincoln, in his proclamation of April 15, had given the Southern forces 20 days in which to disperse and return peaceably to their respective abodes. This was generally interpreted to mean that the President would wait until May 5 and then would begin the invasion of the South. He might not delay even that long in employing the Navy, which was readily for action. Twelve days, then, Lee had, from April 23 to May 5, in which to prepare Virginia for the first shock of the invasion that was certain to be visited on the Old Dominion sooner than on any other state, because she was on the frontier. What resources could he command for so huge an undertaking? Enthusiasm, yes, for many of the volunteer companies had assembled, in addition to those that had marched on Norfolk and on Harper's Ferry, and they were clamoring to be mustered into service. Some arms Virginia had in facilities of a sort for equipping and uniforming a number of troops. The militia had a paper organization, the Commonwealth had decent local credit. A measure of help could be expected from the Confederacy, for it had been making readily since February. But of organization there was little and of naval vessels there were almost none. How did Lee view this prospect? He was convinced that war would come, that it would be prolonged, he feared for reasons all too valid. The war may last ten years, he wrote Mrs. Lee, when he had been in Richmond only eight days. 
He warned those around him, one member of the military committee of the convention attested that they were just on the threshold of a long and bloody war and advised them if they had any idea that the contest in which they were about to engage was to be a slight one, to dismiss all such thoughts from their minds, saying that he knew the northern people well, and knew that they would never yield in that contest except at the conclusion of a long and desperate struggle. The fullest expression of Lee's mind at this time, oddly enough, is to be found in a letter of May 5th to a little girl in the North, the daughter, no doubt, of friends of happier days. She had asked for his photograph, which he sent her with a letter that concluded, It is painful to think how many friends will be separated and estranged by our unhappy disunion. May God reunite our severed bonds of friendship and turn our hearts to peace. I can say in sincerity that I bear animosity against no one. Wherever the blame may be, the facts that we are in the midst of a fratricidal war. I must side either with or against my section of country. I cannot raise my hand against my birthplace, my home, my children. I should like, above all things, that our difficulties might be peaceably arranged, and still trust that a merciful God, whom I know will not unnecessarily afflict U.S., may yet allay the fury for war. Whatever may be the result of the contest, I foresee that the country will have to pass through a terrible ordeal, a necessary expiation, perhaps, of our national sins. May God direct all for our good, and shield and preserve you in yours. To another and older friend, Rev. Cornelius Walker, he wrote, I shall need all your good wishes and all your prayers for strength and guidance in the struggle in which we are engaged and earnestly and humbly look for help to him alone who can save us and who has permitted the dire calamity of this fratricidal war to impend over us. If we are not worthy that it should pass from us, may he in his great mercy shield us from its dire effects and save us from the calamity our sins have produced. Conscious of my imperfections and the little claim I have to be classed among Christians, I know the temptations and trials I shall have to pass through. May God enable me to perform my duty and not suffer me to be tempted beyond my strength. Lee could not proceed according to any formally drafted plan, matured at leisure or taken from a vault where it had been placed in advance by a general staff that had foreseen all the contingencies and had drafted all the orders. His plan, on the contrary, had to be shaped virtually as it was being executed, in an atmosphere of excited haste and with scant trained assistance. Yet as Lee's successive steps are retraced from his dispatches, their logic appears, and it is possible to see why he acted when he did. Emergencies forced him to extemporize. Limitation of men and of materials restricted him. He was compelled, on occasion, to attempt simultaneously many preparations he would have preferred to undertake successively. He held fast, however, to the essentials of a systematized, if hurried, program. He postulated everything on the maintenance of a strict defensive as long as possible. That was put above everything else. He saw Virginia could not undertake an offensive or even an offensive defensive, and he reasoned that if limited operations were temporarily successful, they would quickly bring upon Virginia attacks that would complicate if they did not defeat his preparation. He enunciated this defensive policy as soon as he entered upon his duties. You will act on the defensive, he wrote on April 24 to the officer whom Letcher had placed in charge on the Rappahannock River. He put his instant disapproval on a wild plan to attempt to throw Virginia troops into Baltimore. It is important, he said, that conflict be not provoked before we are ready. Lest seizure lead to reprisals, he earnestly urged that ships should not be detained in Virginia waters unless they were necessary for the defense of the state. The most that he would countenance on any of the fronts was the removal of the buoys and the destruction of the lightships in the Potomac River off Alexandria. In holding to this basic strategy, while organizing the Virginia forces, Lee had to restrain the ardor of men who believed that an early offensive meant an easy victory over an effete foe. Soon after the secession of Virginia, L. Pope Walker, the Confederate Secretary of War, sent to Richmond a friend who might be termed an unofficial observer. This gentleman, D. G. Duncan, was very critical of Lee's caution. In daily telegrams to Walker, Duncan lamented the manner in which the Virginia commander sought, as he averred, to repress the enthusiasm of the people. Duncan went so far as to hint that there was treachery in Virginia, though ultimately he was convinced that Lee was acting with vigor. 
so far as is known, Lee paid no heed to Duncan, but he could not wholly ignore the boasts of the uninformed or the invective of the bitter, for he regarded every overconfident expression as dangerous, and every disposition to minimize the fighting qualities of the North as an obstacle to adequate preparation in the South. Braggadocio was worse than that. He wrote Mrs. Lee when he had been in Richmond three weeks, I agree with you in thinking that the inflammatory articles in the papers do us much harm. I object particularly to those in the southern papers, as I wish them to take a firm, dignified course, free from bravado and boasting. Later on, when all serious men should have seen that the calamity of a long and bitter war had fallen on America, an indulgent father brought a young hopeful of five years to Lee's office to present a Bible to the general. An aide pleaded Lee's preoccupation, but the general heard the conversation and insisted that the visitors be admitted. Having made the gift, the little boy was sitting on Lee's knee when the father demanded of him, what is General Lee going to do with General Scott? The lad, having been coached in advance, replied promptly, he is going to whip him out of his britches. Lee's manner changed instantly. He stood the youngster on his feet, looked at him intently, and spoke to the father over the tiny fellow's shoulders. My dear little boy, he said very earnestly, you should not use such expressions. War is a serious matter, and General Scott is a great and good soldier. None of U.S. can tell what the result of the contest will be. In this spirit, having determined on a defensive policy, Lee had to ask himself seven questions. 1. How could he offset the sea power of the North, with its immediate, constant threat to Virginia, open as the very heart of the state was to invasion up her long tidal rivers? 2. Should he attempt to hold Harper's Ferry, and could he retain Norfolk, with its dry dock, its machinery, and its proximity to the sea? 3. How were competent officers to be procured in sufficient numbers for the troops that were to be called into the field? 4. On what basis and with what personnel was the general staff to be organized? 5. Prompt mobilization and early training were necessary, how were they to be effected? 6. In what way were the necessary arms and equipment to be provided and distributed? 7. When mobilized, armed, trained, where could the Virginia forces be disposed to meet effectively the advance of a superior enemy that not only controlled Chesapeake Bay, but was able to move into Virginia simultaneously from the north, the east, and the west? His answer to the first of these questions was a vindication of all that Mahan was later to argue regarding sea power. The readiness of the Federal Navy was more to be regarded at this time than the mobilization of a great Federal Army. Virginia must be saved from the possibility of a fleet movement up the Rappahannock, the York, or the James, all of which were navigable to points within striking distance of Richmond. Governor Letcher had been quick to sense this danger. Embarrassed as he had been by the lack of military experience and of trained advisers, he had taken the first defensive steps immediately after the Ordinance of Secession had been passed. On April 20, the convention had created the advisory commission of three that Lee had seen in the hall of the convention, Judge Allen, Colonel Smith, and Captain Morey. With the help of these men, the governor had proceeded to organize for the defense of the rivers. Powder had been hurried from Norfolk. Subsistence and quartermaster services had been set up, commanders had been named on the Potomac and on the Rappahannock, a veteran naval officer had been named to conduct the Norfolk Navy Yard, heavy ordnance had been transported from that city, though there were no carriages for it, some light artillery had been sent to the Potomac, and the state's engineer had been dispatched to Gloucester Point and to Yorktown, at the mouth of the York River, to lay out batteries there. Lee pushed this work with the most insistent vigor. The state engineer proved to be none other than Lee's chief of happier days, Colonel Andrew Talcott. Lee was happy to renew association with this able officer, though, he wrote Talcott, I sincerely lament the calamitous times in which we have fallen. From New York, Talcott proceeded to Norfolk, where he found the utmost confusion prevailing, and thence, by Lee's orders, he went up the James River to select the most suitable sites for batteries. Lee left the location of these works entirely to the discretion of the energetic old colonel, in whose judgment he had full confidence. But when the batteries had been designed and staked off, who was to construct and to arm them? Perhaps, for answer, Lee went back in memory to the siege of Vera Cruz when he had seen sailors quickly mount long guns. Perhaps his choice was that of necessity.
Whatever the prompting, he turned over this part of the task to the naval personnel of Virginia, which had been quickly and efficiently organized from resigning United States officers. An admirable job the Navy made of it. Steadily through the days when it seemed impossible to procure transportation with which to move from Norfolk the cumbersome guns that often weighed more than three tons, the officers worked fast and successfully. There were, however, one or two close races between the Virginia Navy on land and the Federal Navy in the Chesapeake. At Gloucester Point things came to such a pass that six-pounder field artillery was employed by the local commander against a Federal warship that seemed to be threatening to enter the river, but within three days thereafter nine-inch columbiads had been planted, and the battery was prepared to execute Lee's orders to challenge all passing ships and to fire on those that refused to stop. Thenceforward the fortification of Gloucester Point went on, with nothing more serious to interrupt it than some friction between the civilian engineer and the military. Across the river from Gloucester Point, at the ancient settlement of Yorktown, a battery was also constructed, and forces were slowly accumulated nearby. Once the channel of the York was commanded, the situation around Yorktown was not regarded as immediately threatening, because the land approaches were protected against a surprise attack by an informal armistice between the Virginians and the Federal forces at Fort Monroe. On the James, Talcott recommended, at the outset, only the fortification of Jamestown Island. A heavy battery was accordingly built there, almost under the eaves of the crumbling church near the site where the first lawmaking body in Anglo-Saxon America had met in 1619. Along the Rappahannock, the people were very apprehensive of an early federal attack. Lee did not believe this would materialize speedily, but as volunteers had been called out at Fredericksburg, he felt they should be retained in that vicinity. Directing that a small battery be erected below Tappahannock, he had to concern himself more with allaying the fears of the populace than with guarding against an ascent of the river. As for the Potomac, little could be done for the defense of Alexandria, nothing, in fact, that would have any other effect than to risk the destruction of the city in case of a federal offensive. Along the lower tidal estuaries of that river there was likelihood of a naval attack and a possible landing, especially on Aquia Creek, which was the northern terminus of the direct railroad to Richmond. Batteries were accordingly placed around the Aquia. Much correspondence and many divergencies of opinion were developed over the fortification of Matthias Point on the Potomac. Considered as a whole, the fortification of the rivers progressed satisfactorily from the beginning and occupied so little of Lee's time that he was able at an early date to turn to the defense of Norfolk and of Harper's Ferry, which jointly constituted the second aspect of his military problem. The property seized by Virginia at the Norfolk shipyard was found to include 1198 guns and was worth some $7,307,000, according to the state's appraisal, but the value to the new government of such a plant and dry dock, with much of the machinery intact, could not be computed in terms of money. If Norfolk could be held, at least one and perhaps three of the scuttled warships could be raised and refitted, and the South would have the means of building other naval vessels until perhaps a formidable fleet might be gathered to dispute with the North the control of Hampton Roads. With Norfolk lost, the South would have no shipyard comparably so well suited for the construction of war vessels. Norfolk, moreover, was strategically located in relation to North Carolina. A railroad ran from Norfolk to Weldon. From Norfolk, also, the Elizabeth River and the Dismal Swamp Canal afforded access for lightships to a point within 15 miles of Elizabeth City, N.C. To possess Norfolk was, therefore, to hold the key to eastern Carolina. Unfortunately, the defense of Norfolk was difficult for a government that did not control Hampton Roads. In relation to the rest of the Commonwealth, the city was at the end of the Petersburg and Norfolk Railroad. This railway ran through Suffolk, near the head of the Nansman River, which empties into Hampton Roads almost opposite Newport News. From the mouth of the Nansman, at Pig Point, the distance to Suffolk is only about 18 miles, most of it navigable for light transports. By dispatching small ships up the Nansman, the Federals might easily cut off Norfolk from Richmond and might then send a land force against the Navy Yard itself, which could readily be turned from the west. Cognizant of all this, Lee nevertheless prepared to fight for so valuable a prize. When he entered on his duties he found that the governor had authorized the commanding officer at Norfolk to accept additional volunteers as soon as he could use them.
Work was being started on four batteries laid out by Colonel Talcott, one of 14 guns at the Naval Hospital, one of 15 guns at Fort Norfolk, one of 12 guns at Pinner Point, and one of 20 guns at Craney Island. Lee directed that the construction of these batteries be pushed and that they be supplemented by works at the mouth of the Nansman to keep the Federals from ascending that stream. During the weeks that followed, he was painfully alert to the possibilities of an attack in that quarter. On May 1, there came news that the Federal ships were sounding up the Elizabeth River as if preparing for an attempt to recapture the Navy Yard. This created a near panic in Norfolk and forced Lee to take additional precautions quickly. He ordered all the valuable metals away from the town, together with the surplus powder, he hurried cartridges to the soldiers there, and he directed the commanding officer to make them on his own account. To Norfolk, also, he forwarded the first troops that came to Virginia from Georgia and Alabama. The result he had to leave to the fortunes of war. The machinery at Harper's Ferry was scarcely less important to the Confederate Army than the Norfolk dry dock and shops were to the sea forces. There had been reports that 400 to 500 small arms had been salvaged at Harper's Ferry out of 16,000 reputed to have been in the arsenal when it had been set afire. Actually, only 4,287 finished small arms had been in storage at Harper's Ferry at the time the Virginians descended upon the place. Few had been secured, and most of them had been carried off by individuals. A considerable number of arms, however, had been in the course of manufacture in the shops, which were virtually intact, with all their machinery, thanks to the vigilance of a southern sympathizer, Master Armor Armistead Ball. Manifestly, if Virginia could retain Harper's Ferry, the manufacture of small arms would go on more rapidly than if the shops were moved. Much time would inevitably be lost if the machinery had to be taken down, shipped to some distant city, and set up again. But there was one great difficulty about retaining the shops at Harper's Ferry, a strong expedition sent out from Washington along the line of the Manassas Gap Railroad could cut off communication from the south. A superior force could easily be collected in Pennsylvania and brought by rail to Hagerstown within seven miles of Williamsport. Thence it might get in rear of Harper's Ferry. The same thing could be done from the west via Martinsburg. The town itself was badly placed to stand a siege by an army advancing on any of these routes because it was in a flat dominated on three sides by very high ground. On the north, the Maryland Heights were across the Potomac, the new international frontier. To occupy Maryland Heights was to take the offensive and perhaps to affront the state of Maryland, which was then hesitating, as most Virginians believed, between secession and allegiance to the Union. Resolving this dilemma, Lee decided to continue the removal of surplus machinery from Harper's Ferry, which he found in progress, and to haul all the machines to Richmond as speedily as possible, but, meantime, to operate the shops as long as any part of the equipment remained. While he was planning this there came into his office a tall, sober-faced young professor, in the uniform of the Virginia Military Institute, to consult with him regarding the use of the cadets of that school, who had been brought to Richmond as drillmasters. Lee had not seen him, so far as is known, since they had left Mexico in 1848, but he had recommended him for his post at the Institute and of course recognized him as Major Thomas J. Jackson. Governor Letcher had known Jackson in Lexington, where the Institute was located, and he nominated him to the convention for commission as Colonel of Infantry. Simultaneously, he directed Lee to put Jackson in command at Harper's Ferry as soon as he was confirmed. The convention accepted the appointment, though the nominee was so little known that some of the members asked, who is this Major Jackson? Promptly and cheerfully enough, Lee ordered Jackson to his post, doubtless without imagining that circumstance and Governor Letcher had combined to bring under his command the one Southern soldier, above all others, who was to show himself the ideal lieutenant. The only thing to suggest during the next few months that Lee had any consciousness of a special relationship between himself and Jackson is the fact that, from the outset, his orders to Jackson were direct and downright, as if he knew he was dealing with a man who understand and obey, without the stimulus of euphemism or diplomatic flourishes. When Jackson arrived at Harper's Ferry, he found something more than 2,000 volunteers and militia there. Increasing hourly, they had little equipment and even less powder and shot. There were too many general officers and too few drill masters. However, Major General Kenton Harper, the senior militia member on the ground, had acted with promptness and good judgment.
On his own initiative, he had negotiated with the Maryland local authorities to give him notice of the approach of the enemy, and he had gained their unofficial consent to occupy Maryland Heights in case of necessity. Jackson acted with the greatest energy. The machinery immediately required in Richmond was moved rapidly, more volunteers were brought up, were organized and were drilled, arms taken from the arsenal at the time of the fire were traced, outposts were established, and, the reports reached Virginia that 5,000 men were mustered at Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, within easy reach of Harper's Ferry, a spirit of confidence was gradually created. Lee was much gratified at Jackson's accomplishments. He prepared to send new troops to him and, in order to keep Harper's Ferry from being turned by way of the Manassas Gap Railroad, he decided to increase the force that Governor Letcher had already sent to Manassas Junction. He had to gamble, of course, whether he would be able to hold Harper's Ferry, but he felt that the machinery in the shops and the strategic value of the position justified the risks. The construction of river batteries and the defense of Norfolk and of Harper's Ferry were tasks that would not wait on organization. Lee had to use the men and materials at hand. As soon as these first defensive measures had been taken he turned to the third aspect of his problem, which was the selection of officers and the creation of a staff. Until this was done, it went without saying that nothing that had been gained was secure and that a general call for troops, which was next in order, could not be sent out. The Militia Law of Virginia had provided an elaborate organization of staff and line, with four divisions, each of them commanded by a major general. The officers of high rank in the militia were, in the main, prominent citizens or elderly men of political influence. The staff of the militia had never functioned and was incomplete in 1861. The volunteers, though numerous, had never been regimented and had no officers above the rank of captain. For the first operations, Governor Letcher, of necessity, had chosen the most available men, chiefly of the militia. He had utilized the company officers of the units that had been ordered on duty, whether of militia or of volunteers. As respected field officers, this arrangement was manifestly so unsatisfactory and so little suited to a real emergency that it had to be changed as speedily as possible. The convention had provided that company officers should be appointed by the governor. The convention also invited all efficient and worthy Virginians in the Army and Navy of the United States to retire therefrom and to enter the service of Virginia. The governor had been directed to assign these officers such rank as will not reverse the relative rank held by them in the United States service and will at least be equivalent thereto. Although some of these officers were at distant posts and would be slow in arriving, the invitation extended by the convention assured ultimately a limited supply of trained soldiers, for nearly all the Virginians of distinction in the Federal Army had resigned, except General Scott and Major George H. Thomas. A commission was set up by the governor, at the instance of the advisory council, to correspond with available men as the convention had directed. Caution was shown from the outset in giving high commissions to politicians even to so influential a person as ex-Governor Henry A. Hawes. To make it certain that professional soldiers were given first consideration, the convention went still further and provided that all names should be submitted to it for confirmation. As Lee himself recommended only experienced men for field command, this requirement imposed no handicap. By May 1st, Lee was sending out commissions in the Army of Virginia to a number of men who later attained distinction. Besides Jackson, Virginia called on Joseph E. Johnston, John Bankhead Magruder, Richard S. Ewell, Harry Haight, Samuel Jones, J. C. Pemberton, William Mahone, L. L. Lomax, John McCausland, and others. As officers of experience reported, they were welcomed and immediately assigned to duty. I am glad to see you. I want you to help me, Lee told Lt. John B. Hood, as he shook that officer's hand on arrival, and before two hours had elapsed Hood was on his way to his post. In a few instances Letcher made nominations without consulting either Lee or the advisory council, and the senior naval officers apparently did the same thing, but friction was slight at the outset. Lee had reasonable prospect of procuring competent brigade officers and a fair number of good colonels and lieutenant colonels by the time he was ready to bring the full force of volunteers into the field. His task was somewhat complicated, however, because neither he nor anyone else knew precisely how desirable a commission in the Army of the Commonwealth might be.
On April 25, the state convention had ratified a pact for temporary union with the Confederacy and had accepted the Southern Constitution, subject to revocation in case the people of Virginia declined to approve the Ordinance of Secession at the polls on May 23. The treaty provided that military operations should be under the chief control and direction of the President of the Confederate States, upon the same principles, basis, and footing as if the Old Dominion were a member of the Confederacy. This might well mean that every Virginia commission would be vacated. It is to be written down to their love of their native state that few Virginians hesitated on this account. The organization of the general staff proceeded simultaneously, if less satisfactorily, under an ordinance adopted by the convention on April 21st and amended three days later. The adjutant generals, quartermasters, subsistence, medical, and pay departments and an engineer's corps were set up. Their respective heads were to be named by the governor and were to be confirmed by the advisory council. The adjutant general's department was to be distinct from the office of the state adjutant general, whose functions were limited to the militia. As the general staff of the militia proved to be useless, some commanders having been compelled to take the field without a single staff officer, it was scrapped in its entirety. Desirable men were not easy to find for the new posts, because most Virginians of military age wished to serve with the combatant units. Engineers were particularly hard to procure. By a series of brief general orders Lee sought to establish system as rapidly as practicable within the departments, and as a shortcut he adopted the old regulations of the United States Army wherever applicable. If the staff was not so efficient as Lee had hoped, it was chiefly because the men appointed to the Virginia staff realized that the Confederate states would soon assume charge of the departments and might supersede them. Virtually no attempt was made to set up an intelligence service as a part of the general staff. Reports of the plans and movements of the federal forces were gleaned from northern newspapers or were gathered slowly from travelers and from private letters. Some of the most important movements were wrongly reported or were not discovered at all. The Virginia press, in its zeal to inform its readers, informed the enemy as well and helped to create in Lee a dislike for newspaper methods that he held to the end of his days. The personal staff of the commanding general, like the general staff, had to be built up in an atmosphere of impermanence. Although he had started without a single assistant, Lee was determined to employ only trained men, so far as they were procurable. It is necessary, he wrote in an early veto on nepotism, that persons on my staff should have a knowledge of their duties and an experience of the wants of the service to enable me to attend to other matters. It was an ideal he never fully realized. Fortunately, R. S. Garnett, who had been Lee's adjutant at West Point, joined Virginia early and accepted the new post of adjutant general. After April 26, Colonel Garnett was with Lee and relieved him of much of the correspondence and of virtually all the drafting of orders. With Garnett in charge of the office, Lee soon moved his headquarters to the top floor of the Mechanics Institute, where he collected a few clerks and, ere long, the staff of two aides and a military secretary allowed him under ordinance of the convention. Lieutenant Walter H. Taylor reported soon thereafter and soon made himself indispensable at Lee's headquarters. Other officers assisted him during the summer, notably Lt. Col. George Diaz and Lt. Col. John A. Washington, the latter a longtime friend in Northern Virginia, a gentleman of the highest type and a true aristocrat. Promptness and system were not attained without an effort, and for the first week's orders were sometimes slow in reaching officers. All work had to be done at a furious rate, amid countless interruptions, ceaseless alarms, and the wildest public confusion. Everyone wanted to fight, few were willing to recognize that war calls, first of all, for ordered preparation. The public seemed to think that arms and ammunition and all the equipment of an army could be provided instantly and by magic, and that all that was needed was the word to go forward and overwhelm the enemy. Lee had to do a prodigious volume of work, but he kept his head, and by May 1st, or about that time, having been in command only one week, he had taken the first necessary steps to fortify the rivers, to hold and to strengthen Norfolk and Harper's Ferry, and to select field and staff officers. This initial stage of his labors brought Lee close to May 5th, the date of the expiration of the period that Lincoln had allowed for the dispersion of the secessionists. As evidence began to accumulate that federal forces were mobilizing in strength and might start an offensive at any time, Lee became more apprehensive for the safety of Harper's Ferry and of Norfolk and decided to issue the call for a general mobilization of volunteers.
that opened a new and a still more difficult period in Virginia's preparations for war. Chapter 29, The Volunteers Are Called Out Immediately following secession the governor and the advisory council had seen the folly of calling out more troops than Virginia needed at Harper's Ferry, at Norfolk, and at other exposed points. Student companies that had hurried to Richmond from the University of Virginia without orders had been sent back to school. The Confederate government had been requested not to forward 13 proffered regiments until Lee had been consulted. But the uninformed public had been insistent and the waiting volunteers had become restive. Despite strong pressure, Lee had postponed a general mobilization of volunteers in the knowledge that arms were limited, that field officers were lacking, and that the general staff had not been organized to transport, to quarter, and to feed the thousands who were anxious to defend their state. Now that the prospect of invasion was imminent, he had to bring the waiting volunteers into the field. Delay after May 5 might be as dangerous as haste before that time would have been confusing. Estimates prior to the dissolution of the Union were to the effect that the state would require about 15,000 soldiers. Lee listed the places that had to be defended, reversed the figures and promptly raised the total to 51,000. To supply this number of men Virginia had a partly organized militia of about 131,000, exclusive of the armed volunteers, who were supposed to number 12,000. In addition, the convention had authorized the establishment of a provisional army, which was really to be a regular army of some 8,000 men, enlisted for three years. A navy of 2,000 men had likewise been sanctioned. Recruiting for the provisional army and for the navy was to be undertaken simultaneously with the enlistment of volunteers. This double appeal for men presented a difficulty. Another difficulty was the sharp division of opinion as to the term of enlistment of the troops who were to be accepted. Some bombastic orators whose overconfidence angered Lee were affirming that an early victory made long enlistments unnecessary. Lee thought that all soldiers should be sworn in for the duration of the war. The convention, after debate, decided to fix the term at one year, a course that was to plague the Confederacy in the spring of 1862. Making the best of what he could not change, Lee devised this method of mobilization, he directed the commanding officers at Harper's Ferry, at Norfolk, at Fredericksburg, at Richmond, and at Culpeper Courthouse to accept companies of volunteers from designated nearby counties, in numbers not to exceed specific totals of each of the three arms of the service. By fixing the company as the unit, he passed the task of individual recruiting to the localities where men of station were willing to collect enough men to form a company either as a patriotic service or as a means of procuring commissions through company elections, as captains or lieutenants. At other centers of population where good railroad connections were available, he named special recruiting officers who were to issue calls to the counties, accept companies, arm them, and either begin their training there or else send them to places where they were needed and could be drilled. No time schedule for a general concentration was attempted. From some of the mobilization centers the commanding officers were directed to forward the troops by companies as rapidly as they were organized and armed. The first call, which covered only one section of the state, was sent out on May 3, the very day that Lincoln signed his second proclamation for 42,000 additional volunteers, 10 regiments of regulars, and 18,000 seamen. Other calls for different parts of the Commonwealth Lee issued on May 6, May 7, and May 9. He watched the response closely. In most counties, the enlistment was general and hearty. From Western Virginia there came varying stories of support and of disaffection, and on the Lower Peninsula, for some reason, volunteers came in slowly. The stern eye of Colonel Thomas J. Jackson found encouragement in the quality of the men, untrained though they were. The whole state is clad in steel, ex-President Tyler wrote. Anxious as Lee was to bring Virginia's manpower quickly into the field, he declined to accept volunteers under the age of 18. Those are beautiful boys, sir, he said of some lads he sent back home, and I very much dislike to refuse them, but it will not do to let boys enlist now. I fear we shall need them all before this war closes. Ere long, it became apparent that the Provisional Army could not be recruited for three years in competition with one-year volunteers. The Provisional Army had accordingly to be abandoned. It served one useful purpose, however, if only one, in that it gave the Governor and the Commanding General an organization in which to commission quickly a number of desirable officers for whom volunteer regiments or companies were not available.
This experience with the provisional force showed that the war was not to be fought either with regulars or with militia, but with volunteers. Mobilization meant training, and that was the fifth aspect of Lee's labor of preparation. In addition to the simple drilling provided at the mobilization centers, a camp of instruction named after Lee was established at Richmond. The cadets of the Virginia Military Institute who had been brought to the city as drillmasters were speedily put to work and some of them were subsequently sent to Harper's Ferry for similar service. They were invaluable. In fact, although the Institute supplied many competent officers during the war, it probably did nothing that helped more materially than furnishing these well-equipped young cadets of soldierly bearing and high morale at this stage of the mobilization. In addition to Camp Lee, an artillery school of instruction was established nearby, at Richmond College, with V.M. cadets again in charge of the raw gunners. The training and review of these men, which Lee occasionally found time to observe in person, gave Richmond its first glimpse of the picturesque side of a war whose horrors the city was soon to witness. New color, thrills, romance were added, a little later, when the first troops from other southern states began to arrive at Camp Lee, the South Carolinians with their palmettos, and the picturesque Louisiana Tigers. Not all the phases of mobilization went as smoothly as the reviews at Camp Lee. Some blunders were made, particularly at Lynchburg. The call sent out from that city did not specify the number of troops that were to be received. The men from so many counties were directed to report there that some of them had to be sent elsewhere. It was at Lynchburg, also, that the first friction between the state and the Confederate authority occurred. With these and some other minor exceptions, however, mobilization and training proceeded better than might have been anticipated. The end of May was to find numerous large camps established in various sections and crowded with youthful volunteers. Within four weeks after the men had been called to the colors 17 regiments were formed and 19 others were being organized from companies that had been brought together and had been given some training. Rail transportation in sufficient quantity for moving all these troops was made available. Lee left his part of the mobilization largely to the railroad authorities. He contented himself with seeing to it that physical connection was established at strategic points and that military commanders should not use rolling stock without authority. On occasion it became necessary to suspend passenger traffic in order to move troops. Beyond a certain stage, mobilization was futile and training was impossible without arms and equipment. Providing these was the sixth aspect of Lee's problem, and during the first period of the war it remained a more difficult matter, by far, than finding troops. Virginia had collected a certain volume of munitions. During the early months of 1861 she had established a Department of Ordnance, had appropriated $800,000 for the purchase of arms and ammunition, and had authorized the counties and cities to borrow money for equipping the militia. The war had come, however, before this legislation of 1861 had yielded results. The sources of supply from which Virginia hoped to draw were as follows. 1. When received into the service of the state, some 5,000 volunteers, and not 12,000 as had been estimated by the adjutant general, carried arms that had been issued by the Commonwealth or separately bought. 2. Virginia had in storage at Richmond and at Lexington something over 60,000 small arms, though 54,000 of these were old flintlock muskets, wholly inferior to the percussion muskets with which the Federals were certain to be armed from the outset. 3. The state hoped that a considerable number of the arms damaged in the evacuation of the Harper's Ferry Arsenal by the United States troops, or in process of manufacture, could be restored or completed and issued. For, there was a possibility that arms might be imported and that a limited supply might be had, by loan or purchase, from some of the southern states if any of them had a surplus. These were the only sources, and Harper's Ferry was to yield little. In order that the best use might be made of the arms that were available the convention authorized Lee to distribute them to Virginia troops and, inferentially, to the secessionists of Maryland. It was a burdensome assignment. The demands from the outset were insistent. Sometimes after volunteers had been received, and occasionally when they were in the face of the enemy, their armament was tragically inadequate. Upon General Koch's arrival on the Alexandria Line, for instance, he found that by no means all his pitiful little force of 300 or 400 men were armed, and those who carried any weapons had only flintlocks of the model of 1818. 
Again, 800 volunteers reported for muster at Williamsburg, just 300 of these had arms, and half of these were antiquated. Among 300 men from the western counties, there were only 55 muskets of the same outmoded type, in bad order. Some commanders, even Colonel T. J. Jackson, demanded more muskets than they had prospects of issuing promptly and had to be denied. In Lynchburg, there was a near mutiny because men who had volunteered as riflemen had flintlocks issued to them. At a very critical stage of operations in western Virginia, when every volunteer counted in determining whether that section would side with the Commonwealth or turn against her, one company reported with no arms whatsoever and two others had to be sent home, as there were no muskets for them. General Joseph E. Johnston, on taking charge at Harper's Ferry, stated flatly that the dispatch of troops without arms simply made his command more helpless. These were typical illustrations of a situation that Lee met as best he could. He had to dole out arms very cautiously in advance of actual enlistment, and he used his scant supply of percussion and altered muskets where he expected the troops to be called speedily to the field. Sir, he said to one man who protested against the inferiority of his company's armament, your people had better write Mr. Lincoln and ask him to postpone this thing for a few months until you can get ready for him. A thousand muskets were procured from North Carolina and were sent to Jackson. New efforts were made to recover arms seized by individuals at Harper's Ferry and the shops that were being operated, in accordance with Lee's plan, as long as he believed it could be done without subjecting the machinery to the risk of capture. Georgia was urged to lend Virginia any surplus arms she possessed, and was diplomatically asked not to look to the hard-pressed Old Dominion to furnish muskets to the Georgia troops sent to Virginia. The Confederate States government received similar notice. The store of percussion muskets was exhausted by the end of May, but through economy, patience, and care in not issuing more than were immediately required by the men at any one mobilization center, the supply of flintlocks held out. Every requisition from Virginia troops was met, and probably more than 10,000 muskets were issued to troops from other states. When the Virginia forces were to be taken over by the Confederate states, Lee's report was to show some 46,000 guns in the hands of the mustard volunteers. It is enough to note, for comparison, that during 1861 the North was able to issue to its soldiers 1,276,686 firearms. As it was with infantry small arms, so it was with arms and equipment for cavalry. The militia included five regiments of cavalry, which had never been armed, and the volunteers on December 15, 1860, had numbered 50 troops, 24 of which had sabers and pistols, while 24 had only pistols. The state had such scanty cavalry stores that all had been issued by May 12. Attempts to procure additional arms from Georgia failed, and Lee could only advise that the men take their double-barrel shotguns with them or privately purchase such weapons where available. The same story seemed in a fair way of being repeated with percussion caps and small arms ammunition. The supply of caps was very limited. An agent sent north to purchase a cap machine prior to secession was barely able to return home empty-handed and in disguise. Early attempts to procure caps in Kentucky and the West yielded little, schemes to construct machines for their manufacture could not be executed quickly, some were found in Norfolk and some were forwarded from Tennessee, but by the end of May all that could be scraped together had been issued to troops and none remained in storage. A later windfall of one million from some undisclosed source of supply saved the day. As for powder, the state had only 50,000 pounds and some 226,000 ball cartridges on December 15, 1860. The increase of this scant stock was very much in mind when the capture of the Norfolk Navy Yard was undertaken. The seizure of 300,000 pounds in that city met immediate needs, though so little rifle powder was taken that cartridges had to be loaded with coarse cannon powder. Lee urged close economy in the use of ammunition and called on the post commanders to take the powder he forwarded to them and to prepare their own cartridges. Of field artillery, the 12 volunteer companies in Virginia had 30 pieces in December, 1860, including about a dozen new Parrot guns. The state had some 300 old light cannon in addition, but most of these were unmounted and lacked harness and equipment. The principal task of the Ordnance Bureau, therefore, was to provide gun carriages and caissons and then to distribute the ordnance to best advantage among the many companies and localities that were asking for it.
By May 16, the few available gun carriages and caissons were dispatched, and a week later the last of the mounted guns and of the harness had been sent from Richmond. The manufacture of additional gun carriages could not be rapid. Horses were provided by the individual cavalrymen, but they had to be purchased for the artillery. This, too, was slow work, as was the manufacture of harness. However, by June 8, 20 light batteries of four guns were to be put in the field, with horses and harness, though some of the batteries had to use wagon bodies as caissons. Thanks to the great store at the Norfolk Navy Yard, the supply of heavy ordnance was ample. The only problem was that of transporting and mounting it. There was some difficulty in procuring type of carriage desired, and an alarming shortage of ammunition existed, but under the good management of the Virginia Navy, 217 guns were soon mounted in 21 heavy batteries in Virginia and more than 300 heavy pieces were sent to the other southern states. Little time, however, was available for tests and none for experimentation. In all supplementary equipment, at the time the general calls for volunteers were made, Virginia was dismally lacking. No tentage, no knapsacks, no cartridge boxes, no flags were ready for issue. In the first brush with federal gunboats, the battery at Sewell's Point, near Norfolk, had to fly the state colors of a Georgia company in the small garrison, as it possessed no others. To avoid the hopeless task of attempting to uniform 51,000 men, Virginia required that the volunteers supply their own clothing, for which an allowance of money was made. Frequently the women of the counties made the uniforms of the first volunteers, and enterprising officers often had the minor equipment for their commands prepared in the towns where they mustered. The need of a large supply of field transport was in Lee's mind from the first, for despite the mobility that the railroads made possible, he knew the armies must often operate at a distance from tracks. According to the standards adopted by the Federal Army, each man required four pounds of transport and each animal 25 pounds. To support an army two marches from its base, 2,000 wagons were required. Virginia never possessed anything like this quantity and was very slow to accumulate the little she ever had. As late as June, 1861, Colonel Magruder had to complain that his men were in danger of starvation for lack of transportation. In the preliminaries of the Manassas campaign, the Confederate Army was served largely by hired wagons and teams. Failure to provide adequate transportation was, perhaps, the worst shortcoming of Virginia's preparation and it was to cost the South dearly. Lack of transportation was one of the chief reasons the Confederates did not pursue the Federals after the first victory at Manassas and it added greatly to the difficulties of Lee's first campaign. While Lee was working in these and other ways to prepare the state forces for the field, the Confederacy was beginning to send Southern volunteer regiments into Virginia to dispute the expected Federal advance. The earliest order for the movement of these troops had been issued without the knowledge of Governor Letcher, and officers holding Confederate commissions had been sent to Lynchburg to prepare for their coming. When Lee's representative arrived in the same town to mobilize Virginia volunteers, there was immediate confusion, which it took much time to straighten out. After some of the Southern troops arrived in Richmond, Letcher directed a Louisiana regiment to report for duty at Harper's Ferry. The colonel of the regiment declined to obey Letcher's order on the ground that governor of Virginia had no control over him. Letcher, with equal assurance and with the approval of the advisory council, determined to exercise authority over all troops in Virginia until the Confederate states acted. Conflict was in the air, and the personal representative of the Secretary of War began to crowd the wire with suspicions of Lee and of Letcher, intimating that Lee was troubled about rank. In a personal exchange of telegrams with the president, Lee explained that he was satisfied with his place in Virginia service. The muckraker was then silenced. Friction was definitely relieved on May 10 by an order from the War Department authorizing Lee to assume control of the forces of the Confederate States in Virginia and assign them to such duties as you may indicate, until further orders. For days later Lee was made Brigadier General in the regular Army of the Confederacy, the highest rank then existing. He continued to discharge all the duties of his Virginia Commission, however, for some weeks, and certain of the duties for a much longer time. Although Lee's new powers were temporarily sufficient for moving Confederate troops, they did not save him from the blunders of inexperience or from overzeal in the War Department.
One of the worst instances of this was the action of President Davis in calling on John B. Floyd, former Secretary of War under Buchanan, to raise a brigade of your mountain riflemen with their own tried weapons. Floyd accepted the invitation instantly and set about recruiting in the face of the state's own call for men. He subsequently sent an agent south in search of arms, precisely as if he were organizing a separate army. Floyd's independent command was to have an unhappy influence on operations in western Virginia, concerning which Lee was beginning to be very apprehensive. For that part of the state lying in and beyond the Alleghenies was strategically important and open to the Federals. Its rivers flowed into the Ohio or into the major tributaries of that stream. A federal force commanding the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad could move up the river valleys, whereas troops from eastern Virginia would have to cross the watersheds. Harper's Ferry was easily turned from western Virginia. United States troops operating from Grafton could advance southeastward and by a shorter march than that to Harper's Ferry could reach Staunton and the upper valley of the Shenandoah. In the larger strategy of a southern war, railway communications in Kentucky and Tennessee might be interrupted by an armed force based on the westernmost counties of Virginia. Sentiment was divided in this wide area, which was potentially a source of considerable manpower either for or against Virginia. Many of the settlers had come down from Pennsylvania, were of different racial stock from the people of the eastern part of the state, lacked their long tradition of states' rights, and were inimical to slavery. Their delegates in the convention, with few exceptions, had been Union men and had left Richmond after the Ordinance of Secession had been passed. Some of these delegates were now agitating for resistance to the state government. Side by side with these politicians and their supporters, especially in the agricultural counties, were groups of slaveholding planters whose interests and views were substantially those of Tidewater and Midland, Virginia. Which side was to control and which army was to occupy this disputed section? Strategically, were the Federals to utilize the B and O for troop movements so that Ohio and New York would march southward to the same drumbeat, or could Virginia hold that railroad and force the East and the West to fight separate campaigns? Would Virginia have to fight on the Rappahannock and the Shenandoah, or could she guard the Potomac and the Ohio? These were heavy questions, in their consequences perhaps the most portentous that arose in Virginia after secession had been determined upon for it was the loss of military control in the western counties that made possible the separatist movement which dismembered the territory of the old dominion and definitely reduced her to a secondary place in a restored union. Had her western counties been saved, Virginia would today be the 20th state in area and in population the 9th. When Lee had first come to Richmond almost all the reports from western Virginia were favorable. Men of standing wrote that the volunteers were mustering, and that if they were supplied with arms promptly they believed they could keep the discontented element in hand. We are full of the war spirit, one volunteer wrote from Kanawha County, and are determined to do our duty in defense of the glorious old Commonwealth. Finding that nothing had been done to secure Western Virginia, except to warn the President of the B and O, not to permit the Federals to use the line for military purposes, Lee proceeded to rally the doubtful counties before he issued the general call for volunteers. On April 2930, he designated officers to undertake the organization of troops at Wheeling, in the Lower Kanawha Valley, and at Grafton. A few days later, Colonel George A. Porterfield, a man of influence in that section, was dispatched to Grafton to take command, with authority to accept five regiments of volunteers. Grafton was strategically most important. Located 175 miles west of Harper's Ferry by rail, on the main line of the B and O, it was the junction for the line to Parkersburg and, in addition, was the logical base for an advance southeastward to the head of the Shenandoah Valley. Porterfield was told to cooperate with the officials of the B and O, who were supposed to be sympathetic, and he was instructed not to interfere with the peaceable operation of the road. Optimism did not last long. By May 6, the bulk of the news from western Virginia became distinctly unfavorable. Jackson reported much disaffection in that section and urged that troops be sent there. Other information was to the same effect, especially from Grafton, where the people were said to be verging on a state of actual rebellion against the authority of Virginia and were confidently expecting federal support from Pennsylvania and Ohio. Lee was very much concerned at this, but aside from ordering arms hurried forward, he felt that he could do little. 
the dispatch of troops from eastern Virginia, in his opinion, would irritate rather than conciliate and would be accepted as evidence of a purpose to influence the free action of the people in voting on the ratification of secession at the election about a fortnight thereafter. As for throwing troops into western Virginia from Harper's Ferry, he doubtless reasoned, quite apart from the safety of the machinery at the arsenal, that if that position were lost, the northwestern counties would certainly be, but that if Harper's Ferry were held, service on the B, and O, was under control and the northwest might perhaps be recovered. To this view he held in the face of strong appeals for a more aggressive policy, but he began to ponder the possibility of raising troops in the loyal border counties to stimulate the weak-hearted and to silence their disaffected neighbors to the westward. Much importance was attached to what might be accomplished by Colonel Porterfield, who reached Grafton on May 14. The date of Porterfield's arrival at Grafton was approximately that on which Lee took up in detail the final aspect of Virginia's defensive preparations, that, namely, of disposing the state's enlarged forces to meet the federal offensive. With Norfolk and Harper's Ferry reasonably well strengthened, he decided he must proceed to concentrate more troops at Manassas Junction, where a small force under General P. St. George Coke had been placed by Letcher before Lee took command. He did not believe that Alexandria and the nearby country would speedily be occupied by the Federals, and he was vindicated in this opinion. Despite endless rumors and many fears of a Federal advance, an informal truce had been agreed upon in front of Alexandria and, as late as May 13, was respected by both sides. On May 6, however, Lee had warned General Koch to prepare for an attack directed from Alexandria, because both he and Koch reasoned that the Federals would certainly attempt to turn Harper's Ferry by way of Manassas Junction. Such an advance would encounter no large streams once the undefended Potomac was crossed. It could be made by at least two good roads through a country that presented no serious, natural obstacles and if it reached the line chantilly centerville manassas Junction, distant only 20 miles from Washington and Alexandria, it would command the railways and the roads leading to Harper's Ferry and to Winchester. Simple seizure of the Manassas Gap Railroad, leading from Manassas Junction to Strasburg, not only would deprive the Confederate forces at Harper's Ferry of all direct railway connection with Richmond, but would similarly cut off the scant force that was trying to rally the state's rights men in northwestern Virginia. Once Harper's Ferry and the Lower Valley fell into the enemy's hands, the only approach to Grafton would be by road over the mountains from Staunton. This will be apparent from the sketch on the following page. Lee did not believe that as good a soldier as General Scott would overlook such opportunities, military and political, as the occupation of the Manassas Gap Railroad would offer. As quickly as he could, Lee now began to dispatch additional officers and men to General Coke for use at Manassas Junction, the point where the Manassas Gap Railroad joined the Orange and Alexandria. In this effort, Lee was vigorously seconded by Coke, who represented the highest of Virginia traditions. An old West Point graduate, a rich planter of fine character, devoted to Virginia, General Coke performed a service during the first months of the war for which he had never received just recognition. Every effort that Lee made to strengthen Virginia's hold on her exposed northern frontier was seconded with the greatest energy by Colonel Jackson at Harper's Ferry. While the machinery was being moved Jackson was collecting troops from the lower Shenandoah Valley and was drilling them zealously. Reinforced by volunteers from Kentucky and Maryland and by units that Lee sent forward, he had raised his force to 4,500 by May 11. Jackson saw a constant threat to Harper's Ferry from Maryland Heights across the Potomac, and without waiting for orders he promptly occupied and fortified that position. Lee was perturbed lest Maryland should take offense at this invasion of her territory, and he cautioned Jackson against inviting an attack he was not strong enough to resist. The question was settled, tacitly, by entrusting the works on Maryland soil to volunteers from that state and to the Kentuckians, who had come to Harper's Ferry without orders and were a quasi-independent force. Jackson carefully omitted from his order book all instructions for the seizure of the Heights. Thanks to his diligence and military judgment, it became apparent that Harper's Ferry not only was measurably safe, as Lee had believed for some days, but that, in certain eventualities, the troops there might be utilized to meet an offensive directed against it by way of Manassas Junction. From the northern end of the line to the eastern Lee had to turn his attention at this stage of the military preparations, for there had been hints of friction between the Army and the Navy at Norfolk and some suggestions that the commanding officer, Brigadier General Walter Gwynne, was submerged in detail.
To adjust these troubles and to ascertain the condition of the defenses, Lee left Richmond on May 16 for the first time since he had arrived on April 22 and made a thorough inspection of Norfolk. He found the situation confused and unsatisfactory. Progress on the fortifications was slow. Hastening back to Richmond as soon as he was convinced that he had found the trouble, he relieved General Gwynne, who had not seen regular military service since 1832. In his place, Lee put Brigadier General Benjamin Huger, a comrade of Mexican days and, as Lee wrote, an officer of great merit. Under General Huger's direction, the construction and arming of the batteries went on with less delay. On May 23, Lee had been in command one month, and that day the voters of Virginia went to the polls to pass on the Ordinance of Secession. It was conceded that they would ratify it overwhelmingly. And after that, everyone believed, invasion would come quickly. Little was known of the mobilization of the United States and in detail that little was not accurate. It was apparent, however, that the greatly superior forces of the North could advance simultaneously from four directions, from the line of the Ohio into western Virginia, from Maryland into the Shenandoah Valley, from Washington to Manassas, and from Hampton Roads on Norfolk or on Richmond. Lee's preparations shows that he had all these possibilities in mind, though he perhaps did not believe the attack from the Ohio would materialize so quickly as it did. Was Virginia ready for the shock? Along the tidal rivers, raw earthworks broke the green landscape, and straining men were putting heavy guns in battery. At Norfolk confusion still reigned, though at the Navy Yard there was great activity. At Gloucester Point, the defenders of the York felt secure, while across that beautiful stream sentinels paced the very parapets the British had thrown up at Yorktown in 1781. Between the York and the James, John Bankhead Magruder was busying himself in drawing a defensive line that had previously been decided upon. Jackson at Harper's Ferry and the commanders at Norfolk and on the Manassas Line saw their numbers increasing daily. In Richmond, the crowds overflowed the once quiet city of John Marshall. The departments were working furiously, the confines of the old fairgrounds echoed all day to grounded arms and to sharp orders of command. South Carolinians and French-speaking Creoles from New Orleans swaggered past porches whence Virginia girls observed them with wide, admiring eyes. Munitions were being shipped hourly, cobblers were turning to the manufacture of harness, and feminine fingers were fashioning knapsacks. The state arsenal, expanded quickly, was preparing cartridges, and the mustard wheelwrights of the whole section were preparing gun carriages. Lee's own headquarters were busy, visited by returned officers eager to offer their services to Virginia, and besieged by an army of civilians seeking contracts. Everywhere in Virginia the boys were leaving home or else were chafing under regulations that forbade them to enlist until they were 18. Many of the younger married men and not a few in early middle life were volunteering also. New companies met periodically for drill and instruction till their ranks were filled and their orders were received to proceed to one of the rendezvous in the state. Then there would be a day of roses and tears, of farewells and cheers, and General Lee would be notified that another company was available for Manassas Junction or for Harper's Ferry. By the middle of May, preparation, excitement, and confidence were in the air, and from confusion order was gradually emerging. But as yet war was in the picturesque stage, when uniforms were new and hopes were high, when youth saw only the glamour and none of the misery of the conflict that was about to open. Chapter 30 The Mobilization Completed The day after the people of Virginia ratified the Ordinance of Secession, Lee received the long-expected news, the Federals that morning, in great strength, had occupied Alexandria and the Virginia side of the Potomac and had captured a small troop of Virginia horse serving as a rear guard there. Lee promptly forwarded to Manassas three regiments of reinforcements and some cavalry and gave orders for dispositions in case the Federals continued their advance. The danger to Manassas Junction was manifestly so acute that he determined to go there and see the situation for himself as soon as he could arrange to leave Richmond. The occupation of the Virginia side of the Potomac had, of course, a personal aspect that Lee could not wholly overlook even in the excited hour of the first movements to present an opposing front to the Federals. It meant that the pleasant hill of Arlington was in the hands of those former friends who now were enemies. Lee had anticipated this and was reconciled to it. His concern was for his invalid wife, not for himself. Mrs. Lee had been very loath to leave Arlington, despite the urging of her husband and the imminence of a federal advance. 
She had long been unable to decide where to go, and not until about May 14 did she betake herself temporarily to nearby Ravensworth. Even then she left many of the family's possessions and some of the Washington relics within easy reach of marauders. Lee knew that Mrs. Lee could not remain for any length of time at Ravensworth without causing embarrassment to Mrs. Fitzhugh for housing the wife of a rebel general, but he was unwilling to have her come to Richmond inasmuch as he expected to take the field speedily. The daughters went to visit friends in Fauquier County, Virginia. Lee had left his sons free to make their own choice and had most carefully urged Custis not to be influenced by his own example. But all of them sided with the South. Custis resigned, came to Richmond, and soon was working as an officer of engineers. Rooney promptly enlisted and was made a captain of cavalry. Robert was heir long to be chosen to like rank in one of the student companies at the University of Virginia, though, because of his youth, his father was as yet unwilling for him to enter the service. Smith Lee returned his federal commission and became a captain in the Virginia Navy. Lee took all these changes calmly. When I reflect, said he, upon the calamity impending over the country, my own sorrows sink into insignificance. The impending calamity was brought nearer, three days after the occupation of Alexandria and Arlington, by a report that federal transports had appeared in Hampton Roads and were unloading troops in large numbers at Newport News, close to Fort Monroe, at the tip of the peninsula, as that part of Virginia between the York and the James River is styled. The second of the four probable federal offensives was taking form. Lee was not unprepared for it. Although the informal truce had continued around Fort Monroe, Lee consolidated the command on the Lower Peninsula under Magruder on May 21 and had been strengthening him as steadily as the numerous calls from other quarters had permitted. Embarrassed by lack of cavalry and of wagons, Magruder was making progress on the line intended to link up Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. Lee reasoned that the troops being collected at Newport News might be planning either to turn the position at Yorktown and thus open the York River, or else to cross Hampton Roads, ascend the Nansman River, cut the railroad from Norfolk to Petersburg, and mask Norfolk. Both possibilities will be apparent from this sketch. Lee accordingly put both Magruder and Huger on notice. He hastened to send more troops to the Norfolk district and some artillery to defend the approaches to Suffolk. Magruder received a few heavy guns to protect his line from being turned by way of the James and continued to improve his position. Before the object of the landing at Newport News had become apparent, Lee felt it necessary to make his proposed visit to Manassas Junction. Leaving Richmond on May 28, he made a hurried inspection of the junction that afternoon and the next morning went on to Fairfax Courthouse. The troops, he found, were increasing rapidly in number, but were in every conceivable state of efficiency and the lack of it. Some were ready for action, some of those who had retreated from Alexandria did not even have arms. The officers ranged from wholly inexperienced civilian volunteers to men with West Point training and a solid background of service in the regular army. Lee promptly made now dispositions to cover the flanks and to place a detachment for observation at Fairfax Courthouse. He concluded that the size of the force to be collected at Manassas would make the Federals cautious in any advance against Harper's Ferry along the south bank of the Potomac and that there consequently would be time for joint operations between the troops at Harper's Ferry and those around Manassas. This was the germ of the strategy subsequently employed in the campaign of 1st Manassas. The selection of the best available commander for the force mustering at Manassas Junction had been giving Lee much concern. General Koch had worked zealously, in the face of many obstacles, but the Virginia Convention had concluded that the state had too many general officers and had reduced their number. Letcher had accordingly renominated Koch, along with others, for rank in the volunteer forces one grade lower than they had previously held. Under another ordinance, officers of the Provisional Army outranked officers of similar rank among the volunteers. This had virtually displaced Koch, who at time had not even had a regiment. Koch had naturally protested, and Lee had been at pains to explain how the change had come about, but there was no alternative to the selection of an officer of commanding rank to take charge of the Manassas line. Brigadier General M. L. Bonham of South Carolina, the fourth officer to be assigned that rank in the Provisional Army of the Confederacy, had reported in Richmond with a brigade of South Carolina volunteers, and as these troops were most needed at Manassas, Bonham was sent there.
Being the senior officer he was given command on May 21 with very detailed instructions to hold to the defensive. Li now concluded that a more experienced soldier than Bonham was needed for Manassas and he began to search about to find him. On his way back to Richmond from Manassas a crowd surrounded Lee's train at Orange Courthouse and, after the fashion of the day, demanded a speech. Lee demurred, for he had neither taste nor time for haranguing an idle crowd. The Orangeman persisted until he felt it would seem snobbishness or discourtesy to refuse. He stepped out and told his auditors that he had much more important matters on this mind than speech-making. All those who were in the service should be drilling, and those who for good reason had not joined the army would do well to attend to their own affairs and to avoid the excitement and rumors of crowds. That was all. It was not the utterance of a man currying favor with the multitude, but it made an impression. When Lee reached the city he found that during his absence President Jefferson Davis had arrived from Montgomery, Alabama, to make Richmond the capital of the Confederacy, in accordance with the invitation of the Virginia Convention. This invitation had been extended on April 27 and had been accepted on May 21, probably because some of President Davis's friends in Virginia had insisted that his presence in Richmond was necessary to a vigorous prosecution of the war. Strategically it was a serious mistake, for it placed almost on the frontier of the Confederacy, in a state whose rivers were open to the warships of the enemy, the capital that was so soon and so surely to become the emblem of the Southern cause that its retention took on a moral significance out of all proportion to the industrial importance of the city, great though that was to the agricultural South. The preliminaries of this unwise removal of the capital to Richmond had not been wholly cordial, and the separate efforts of the state government and of the Confederacy in Virginia had not been without friction. Governor Letcher had been in no hurry to effect the transfer of the Virginia forces to the Confederacy. An inquiry from Secretary Walker concerning the strength and position of the troops of the Old Dominion had gone unanswered, and when, on May 1, this inquiry had been repeated, Letcher's answer had been a simple statement of Virginia's military resources and plans for mobilization. Later, when Walker had asked whether Virginia desired the Confederate government to take charge of operations, the governor had contented himself with saying that he would act until the Confederacy assumed the direction of affairs. The Montgomery government had not pursued the subject further, but had gradually asserted its authority thereafter, and on occasion had ignored both Letcher and Lee, though, on May 10, Lee had been given command of all the forces in Virginia. General Joseph E. Johnston had been ordered on May 15 by the War Department to take charge at Harper's Ferry, without reference to Lee, and had been directed to forward from Lynchburg to Harper's Ferry certain Confederate troops that Lee had previously earmarked for Richmond. Subsequently, while Lee had been ordering Confederate forces already in Virginia to points where they were needed, the War Department had dispatched other Southern regiments to Virginia, some to report to Lee and some to move to assigned posts, apparently without regard to Lee's control. Lee had recommended at the very beginning that Johnston be given rank equal his own, and had assigned him to temporary duty around Richmond as a major general on April 26, but in the rebellion of the convention at too many exalted military titles, Johnston had been made brigadier general in the Provisional Army of Virginia, a position next to that of Lee. Johnston, however, had preferred to accept a commission as brigadier general in the Confederate Army, and it was in this capacity that he had been assigned to Harper's Ferry. On his way to that post Johnston had written Lee and had announced to him, the president intends to assemble an army near Harper's Ferry. On Johnston's arrival, there Jackson had refused to recognize the new officer's seniority until he had seen documentary evidence of it, but he had then supported him cordially. Johnston had found all the approaches well guarded and more than 8,000 troops at Harper's Ferry, 7,000 of them armed. Raw though they were, a fierce spirit animated these rough-looking men, in the words of the inspector, and their only serious deficiency had been in horses for the artillery. The Maryland Heights had been held, plans had been made to block the railroad at Point of Rocks, and conditions generally had been favorable, even if it had been rumored that the Federals had increased to 15,000 the men supposed to be at Chambersburg and Carlisle, Pennsylvania Johnston, however, had been apprehensive from the first, was doubtful of his ability to hold Harper's Ferry, and, though he recognized Lee's authority and even went so far in one letter as to style him commander-in-chief, he was only too plainly out of sympathy with Lee's plan to retain Harper's Ferry as long as practicable. Johnston's attitude, the conflict of authority, the arrival of Davis, and the near approach of the day when the Virginia forces would be taken over by the Confederacy added to the difficulties of Lee's position.
There was a feeling of uneasiness and perhaps of jealousy toward the Confederacy on the part of some Virginia officers. They had doubts concerning their future status, despite the purpose of the Advisory Council to provide for all those capable officers who had resigned from the United States Army. However, in this muddle, with a president and a governor, a confederacy and a state alike to be served, Lee had one asset in his steadfast refusal to be incensed by slights or provoked by the clash of authority. Another asset was the esteem of the president. Jefferson Davis was then close to his 53rd birthday, a year and a half younger than Lee. Although his father had been a man of scant schooling, his blood was good, and his instincts, his bearing, and his manners were those of an aristocrat. His well-chiseled features and his fine head bespoke high intelligence, his thin, erect form was commanding and gracious. In his dealings with the public he had dignity without austerity, and his speeches were usually impressive. His experience had been long and varied, as planter, as volunteer in the Mexican War, as senator, and as secretary of war in the cabinet of Franklin Pierce. Although not a profound strategist, his understanding of military matters was sound and his viewpoint in war essentially that of the professional soldier. Brief as his service had been in the regular army, he never forgot West Point or the relations between commanding officer and subordinate. Had he been in the field, as a minor officer, neither Lee nor Jackson would have been more mindful of discipline than he. In his capacity as commander-in-chief he expected to be obeyed as he would have obeyed. In administration, he was of average capacity or better, occasionally disposed to delay decisions but usually reaching them promptly and reasonably without permitting himself to be engulfed in detail. He had in him, in fact, some of the qualities essential to the success of a revolution, but these were coupled with serious weaknesses, only a few of which had become apparent in the summer of 1861. His nature was exceedingly sensitive, perhaps because he had received more than his share of applause and had seldom had the tonic of personal criticism. His health, moreover, was uncertain. At intervals, and most inconveniently when he was under the strain of anxious vigils and difficult decisions, he suffered from the inflammation of a facial nerve that caused him agony and prostrating illness. He endured this with fortitude and often discharged his duties when he was almost blinded by suffering and was subjected every few minutes to sharp spasms of the affected nerve, but on occasion his long combat with physical pain made him irritable. His political life had been an endless struggle for a strict and rigid interpretation of legal right, and he was to prove himself too much of constitutionalist to be a daring revolutionary. He hesitated to exceed the admitted limits of his authority as president, and when he did so he was an unconvincing as he was irritating, but he was instant to claim his full constitutional prerogatives, and in doing so he was often abrupt and sometimes unreasonable. Two things were certain to make him hostile, one was to accuse him of unfairness, the other was to impinge upon his authority as president. In his dealings with men he applied to the fullest the political maxim of loyalty to friends and of hostility to foes. His judgment of men was not exceptional, for he relied too much upon the impressions formed in youth, and impressions once formed he was slow to change. If he named one of his supporters to office, criticism of his appointee he would almost invariably regard as criticism of himself. With a political antagonist he would dispute to the last line of a long correspondence in as high regard for logical victories in the theoretical points at issue as if he were speaking for the Congressional Globe. In the end, if he could not convince he would not attempt to conciliate, but would accept a man as a permanent enemy and would sever relations with him. He had energy, he had a measure of vision, he had patience, patience with everything but contradiction. His stubborn loyalty to friends of mediocre mind was to cost the Confederacy dearly, but in the case of Lee his loyalty was to be, perhaps, his largest service to the South. Davis had not forgotten Lee's superintendency at West Point and his reputation in the old army. At this time, and always, as he subsequently testified, Lee had his unqualified confidence, both as a man and a patriot, and had the special knowledge of conditions in Virginia that was most useful. From the time of his arrival in Richmond, Davis kept Lee near him and consulted often with him. Together, on Lee's return from Manassas Junction, they conferred on the choice of a commander for that exposed line. The president decided to entrust the post to Lee's friend of earlier days, the hero of Charleston, General P. G. T. Beauregard, who was then in Richmond.
Beauregard was called in, was given a review of the situation, and was directed to leave the next day for Manassas. His orders, which Lee prepared, were for close vigilance and a strict defensive, a course that Beauregard complained, years afterwards, left him no discretion and no initiative. Had he complained at the time it probably would have made no difference, for Lee had not modified in the slightest his view that Virginia's safety demanded that she avoid aggression until she was prepared to meet it. The dispatch of Beauregard to Manassas put three of the four exposed posts in Virginia under the charge of professional soldiers of experience, Huger and Magruder were on opposite sides of Hampton Roads, Johnston was at Harper's Ferry, Beauregard faced the enemy below Washington. Conditions in each of these threatened areas were improving hourly. Very different was the situation in the fourth zone of probable federal advance, Western Virginia. For two weeks, the news from that quarter had been bad. Optimistic reports had given place to gloomy intelligence of disaffection, opposition, and open hostility. By May 21, Lee had realized that volunteers would not be raised in adequate numbers in the northwestern counties, and he had adopted the alternative, which he had been maturing, of sending into that section troops from nearby counties in the hope that they would gather strength as they advanced. Commanding officers were enjoined anew to prevent the use of the Baltimore and Ohio by the enemy, though Lee had rejected the proposal of Colonel Jackson that a strong force should be thrown into northwest Virginia as soon as the vote on secession was announced. Lee did not have the men to spare, and he could not afford to risk Harper's Ferry or the troops that were garrisoning it. On June 1 a messenger arrived from General Johnston with dispatches. One of them contained a rumor which had reached Harper's Ferry to the effect that Colonel Porterfield had evacuated Grafton and that the Federals had occupied it. Lee was loath to believe that this had happened and still less prepared to learn a few days later that Porterfield had been surprised at Philippi, 15 miles south of Grafton, and had lost most of his equipment. This was a serious matter, for Philippi was closer by 40 miles to Staunton than to Harper's Ferry. If the enemy were permitted to advance unhindered through the mountains to Staunton, a distance of about 120 miles by road, the whole of western Virginia might be cut off. A third federal offensive of unknown strength was thus developing more rapidly and in some respects more ominously than either the threat against Manassas Junction or the concentration in Hampton Roads. Both the state and the Confederate authorities moved quickly to redeem the situation. Porterfield was relieved and brought before a court of inquiry. The militia in seven counties were ordered out. A special expedition was planned to burn the Cheat River Bridge on the Baltimore and Ohio. Colonel R. S. Garnett, Lee's adjutant general, was commissioned brigadier general and was hurriedly sent to the Allegheny Mountains. Plans were laid road reinforce him rapidly by way of Staunton. As soon as these necessary measures of relief had been initiated, Lee paid a visit on June 6 8 to the York and James Rivers, for the Confederate authorities were about to take over the Virginia forces, and Lee wished to satisfy himself that the batteries had been properly placed and armed. He found the work almost completed by the naval officers and by the engineers entrusted with it. Three batteries had been constructed on the York, and 19 of their 30 heavy guns were already in position. In the two batteries on the lower James, 20 of the 32 guns were ready for service. Like progress had been made on the other tidal rivers that time did not permit Lee to visit. Five batteries had been thrown up along the estuaries of the Potomac, one had been dug on the Rappahannock, three were being erected on the Nansmond, though they were not yet armed, and several had risen around Hampton Roads. On the Elizabeth River and in the immediate vicinity of Norfolk there were six batteries, mounting 85 guns, most of them already prepared for action. Field works of an elaborate nature had also been constructed around Norfolk, and the Jamestown-Williamsburg-Yorktown line was taking form. On his way back to Richmond, Lee was able to stop for a few hours at the White House, though in circumstances far different from those that had formerly attended his visits to that old plantation. His daughter Annie and his daughter-in-law Charlotte were there, together with his little grandson and namesake. Rooney was away and did not arrive until the coming of the train that carried Lee back to the capital city. The ceremony of transferring the Virginia forces to the Confederacy was now to be completed. The Confederate government during the preceding fortnight had been assuming additional parts of the somber work of defense, the Council had tendered all Virginia resources on June 1, reserving only the machinery seized at Harper's Ferry, and on June 5 the Confederate War Department somewhat ostentatiously had called on Virginia to surrender the control of military operations.
On Lee's arrival from York River on June 8, the governor formally issued his proclamation, which Lee incorporated in a general order. In one sense, Lee's immediate task was finished. The rivers were defended by the batteries he had just inspected. The Navy Yard was operating again, and the frigate Merrimack, raised from the bottom, was in dry dock. The old United States had been fitted with guns. Arrangements had been made to salvage the sunken Plymouth and Germantown. As far as practicable, Norfolk had been secured from direct attack and from a turning movement by way of Suffolk. 7,000 troops, Virginia and Confederate, were on duty there. Magruder had somewhat more than 5,100 men on the Lower Peninsula. A slightly larger force, approximately 5,500, was in Richmond and in Ashland as a reserve. On the Manassas Line, 7,000 men or more had been assembled, with 2,700 around Fredericksburg and on the Lower Potomac. At Harper's Ferry, the Virginia units mustered 7,000 of a force that exceeded 8,000. All told, approximately 40,000 troops had been enlisted and armed from Virginia and had been supplied with field officers, staff, and partial equipment. Nearly all these soldiers had some lead and powder. A million percussion caps, with 114,400 rounds of infantry ammunition, were to be available in the Virginia laboratory when delivered to the Confederacy on June 14. 115 field guns had been issued, including 20 batteries of four guns each, harness and caissons complete. The whole mobilization had cost Virginia $3,779,000, including unpaid accounts and claims, and it had been affected in slightly less than eight weeks, during seven of which Lee had been responsible. Thanks largely to Lee's insistence upon a defensive policy, the work had been done without a single major engagement and with only three brushes, involving some fifty casualties, of whom seven, or thereabouts, had been killed. The record speaks for itself. When it is remembered, Lee reported to the governor that this body of men were called from a state of profound peace to one of unexpected war, you will have reason to commend the alacrity with which they left their homes and families and prepared themselves for the defense of the state. As an achievement in mobilization, it would seem to be without serious error. As a feat in the preparation of a force for service under the conditions of combat prevailing in 1861, it was deficient only in the failure to provide adequate field transportation and in the inability of the state properly to equip the cavalry. In the larger view of strategy, the disposition of the forces, as mobilized, was sound otherwise than as respected Western Virginia. Lee doubtless was deceived by the first reassuring reports from that area of disaffection. He probably acted with wisdom in refusing to weaken Harper's Ferry in order to send troops westward along the line of the Baltimore and Ohio, for he might have lost both the column he sent out and Harper's Ferry itself. Limited as his forces were, he had to take chances somewhere. But with the fullest allowance for all these conditions, and with the rough character of the country and the hostility of a large element of the people taken into account, one turns the pages of the correspondence regarding Western Virginia with the feeling that the import of the loss of that section was not foreseen, or else that Lee yielded more readily than was his habit to obstacles which were bad enough yet scarcely more serious than others' his energy and strategic sense elsewhere. Overcame in effecting the mobilization of Virginia, Lee had hearty encouragement from first to last. Except for the criticisms of Secretary Walker's agent, D. C. Duncan, the records yield no evidence of hostility to Lee or of any lack of cooperation with him. The Richmond press was sympathetic and admiring, or, at worst, refrained at this time from criticism of him. The powerful inquirer and the chatty dispatch were warmly his supporters. When General Lee assumed the command of affairs here, the dispatch stated editorially, two days before the Virginia forces were transferred to the Confederacy, everyone knows that our military preparations were in a condition which it makes us shudder to look back upon. But he gave himself, head, heart, and soul, to the great work, and so wisely, skillfully and energetically has he used all the resources at his command, that the insolent enemy, notwithstanding his boasted numbers and important possession of the powerful fortress of Old Point, has been held at bay, and compelled to postpone his march of invasion till now we can set him at defiance. 
We do not pretend that everything has been done which could be done if General Lee had possessed at the start an army of a hundred thousand or even fifty thousand men, but, bearing in mind the feebleness of our resources, at the beginning, in men, arms and munitions of war, remembering that the organization of a large military force is a work of such time and labor that, up to this hour, the federal government, with all its immense resources of men, means and machinery, has not been able to put itself in position for attack, we may point with honest pride to the position Virginia is now in for defense, and claim that even General Scott, with all his boasted military genius and experience, and all the vast resources of his section, has not proved himself as great and efficient a leader as the son of Light Horse Harry, the sagacious, intrepid and high-souled chieftain of Virginia. This was the prevailing opinion and it was expressed formally to the Virginia Convention by Governor Letcher in his report on the mobilization. He said, it is due to truth and justice that I should here record my high appreciation of the industry, judgment and professional skill which has marked the conduct of the distinguished officer who had been called by me, with the unanimous approval of the convention, to conduct the military and naval operations of Virginia. Jubal A. Early, a member of the military committee of the convention, subsequently attested the act of energy and utter abnegation of all personal consideration with which, Lee, devoted himself to the work of organizing and equipping the Virginia troops for the field. Heavy as were the calls on Lee's energy and patience, during these difficult seven weeks, his strength of body and of character was equal to them. There is a postbellum tradition that he was something of a bear at this time, and it is possible that he did not then have all the imperturbable self-mastery that later elicited the wondering admiration of his subordinates, but there is not an echo in contemporary records of any violent outburst. He arrived early and punctually at his office every morning and methodically transacted business, with a close eye to detail, but not, Walter Taylor observed, as is sometimes the concomitant, if not the result of this trait, neglectful of the more important matters dependent upon his decision. He seemed, Colonel Taylor further recorded, to address himself to the accomplishment of every task that devolved upon him in a conscientious and deliberate way, as if he himself was directly accountable to some higher power for the manner in which he performed his duties. Anxious as he was to take the field, and convinced that his stay in Richmond would not be permanent, he met patiently the vexations of office work. Only in his handling of his heavy correspondence was the worry and annoyance of his post manifest to his little staff of aides and clerks. He did not enjoy writing, indeed, he wrote with labor, and nothing seemed to tax his amiability as much as the necessity for writing a lengthy communication, but he was not satisfied unless at the close of his office hours every matter requiring prompt attention had been disposed of. When the last letter was signed and the last order given in the afternoon, he would take one or two of his official family with him and would ride out to some camp or fort around Richmond, combining necessary exercise with an inspection and when he returned it was often to seek out some group of children and to talk with them. No homesickness was discernible in his letters, and there must have been distinct relief for him to know that Mrs. Lee, having left Ravensworth, was at Chantilly, cheerful and reconciled to indefinite absence from Arlington. He had committed his loved ones, along with his own destiny, his strategy, and his preparations for Virginia's defense, into the hands of a god who was never more personal or more real to him than in those days of a divided nation's insanity. The religious note that had become the strongest of his life in the hour when he had cast in his fortune with Virginia and it so remained to his last day. In God alone must be our trust, he wrote cautiously in a frank avowal that mediation was impossible. Domestic letters contained prayers and self-reproach for ingratitude to God for past mercies. God's will be done, he said. We must be resigned. And again, be content and resigned to God's will. Are you sanguine of results? A minister asked him in the midst of the intense strain of the first ordeal. At present, he answered calmly and with a sincerity that saved his words from any suggestion of can't, I am not concerned with results. God's will ought to be our aim, and I am quite contented that his design should be accomplished and not mine. Chapter 31 The War Opens on Three Virginia Fronts An empty title was left Lee when the Virginia forces were transferred to the Confederate States on June 8, 1861, an empty title and a non-existent command. The regiments raised under his care were now subject to the direction of the War Department. The staff he had called into being with so much labor ceased to function. For the moment he seems almost to have forgotten that he was a brigadier general in the regular army of the Confederacy, subject to call at any time. 
the distaste for a public life that he occasionally felt in a period of uncertainty showed itself again, I do not know what my position will be, he confided to Mrs. Lee. I should like to retire to private life, if I could be with you and the children, but if I can be of any service to the state or her cause, I must continue. He told Maury, in terms less particular, that he did not know where he was. Maury commented, you may rely on it, the Confederate States government has come here feeling that there is between it and a something of antagonism. It was Maury's private opinion that Davis did not like Lee. Considering that inquiry would smack him modestly of place hunting, Lee had no intention of asking about his status, and the president had not thought to discuss it with him when, on June 10, there came news of something approaching a battle at Big Bethel, eight miles northwest of Newport News. Major General Benjamin F. Butler had planned a surprise attack on a troublesome Confederate outpost of Magruder's command, but one of his regiments, becoming confused, fired into another and had given the alarm. A force of some 1,400 Confederates met the poorly organized attack of seven federal regiments and drove them back, inflicting 76 casualties, including one major and the youthful Lieutenant Colonel John T. Grebel, who had been one of Lee's cadets at West Point. By good chance, some of the Parrot guns purchased by Virginia in 1860 had been sent to Magruder and had been in battery at Big Bethel. They had given the Confederates a definite advantage. Although it could not have happened precisely so anywhere else in Virginia, the hurriedly mobilized Confederate forces at Big Bethel actually had seemed better equipped than had the Union troops whose government had full access to the markets of the world. This little action, involving the loss of only eight Confederate soldiers, naturally encouraged the South, but it was evidence that the Federals were prepared to take the offensive on the Lower Peninsula. And as Magruder's position was by no means secure against combined attack by land and water, he had to be strengthened. To this task Lee was assigned immediately. Dispatching congratulations to Magruder, he counseled that officer and the president concerning the defense of the peninsula and the fortification of the James, precisely as if the responsibility were still Virginia's alone. More troops and more heavy guns were forwarded, defects in the line in front of Williamsburg were corrected, the small steamer teaser was assigned to scout duty on the lower James, and the batteries along that river were improved, somewhat contrary to Magruder's judgment and according to Lee's plans. Magruder, who was wise enough to anticipate a long contest, logically acquiesced and very industriously prepared his command for emergencies and even embodied some of the militia. Operations on the peninsula were closely bound up with those around Norfolk and on the Rappahannock. In the course of a few days, and without any formal written orders, Lee was directing the defense of eastern Virginia, including Richmond, while the War Department and the President in person took over the preparation of the forces at Harper's Ferry and Manassas Junction for the attacks that manifestly were in the making. Western Virginia remained in some sense a charge both on Davis and on Lee, but the latter was authorized to carry on correspondence with Garnett and to receive that officer's reports. Much of the now familiar routine was resumed. Lee expedited the construction of the system of earthworks that Colonel Talcott had designed for Richmond, and he undertook some defenses for the Rappahannock River also, having become a bit more apprehensive of possible offensive movements there. The probability of an attack on Norfolk he kept constantly in mind as he steadily built up its garrison and the forces on the Nansmond. In a short time, the Norfolk line, completed and fully armed, was held by six regiments of infantry, one of cavalry, and five companies of artillery, in addition to the naval units. Besides all this, Lee charged himself with equipping and bringing into the field the thousands of Virginia troops who had not been ready for transfer on June 8 and were now to be mustered directly into the Confederate service. As late as the spring of 1862, he occasionally acted as commander of the Virginia forces in matters of enlistment and organization. In the intervals between other assignments, Lee drew up his report, as of June 15, on the mobilization of Virginia. Governor Letcher forwarded it to the convention on June 17. There was, of course, no vainglory in this document. It was simple and concise. Its only line of praise was for those who had responded quickly to the call of their state. Its only expression of regret was that the western counties had not supplied their quota of men. Daily, after June 15, Lee's duties were enlarged, though they were not defined. Jealous as was President Davis of his prerogatives, and instant as was his resentment of all interference, he made the most, in frequent conferences, of Lee's abilities and of his exact knowledge of conditions in Virginia.
Soon Lee was in one sense an acting assistant secretary of war and in another sense deputy chief of the general staff, to borrow a later military term, for Davis at this period of the war was his own chief of the general staff. Fortunately for Lee, though his own military family had changed somewhat in personnel, it was still adequate to serve him in the discharge of his miscellaneous duties. Colonel Garnett's Virginia commission had been vacated, but he had been named a brigadier general when sent to Western Virginia. Walter Taylor had been retained as a first lieutenant in the regular army of the Confederacy. In Garnett's place had come Lieutenant Colonel R. H. Chilton, with whom Lee had served in Texas. Colonel Diaz still worked at Lee's headquarters when not engaged in making inspections, and Colonel Washington remained on duty. Taken as a whole, the work was both difficult and uncongenial. Although Lee discharged it cheerfully, of course, he desired to be sent on duty with troops and hoped that assignment in Richmond would be brief. My movements are very uncertain, he wrote Mrs. Lee on June 24, and I wish to take the field as soon as certain arrangements can be made. I may go at any moment, and to any point where it may be necessary. There were ample reasons why Lee could not be certain whither he would be sent. Apart from Hampton Roads and Tidewater, Virginia, a sudden blow might be struck in northern or western Virginia by a secret concentration. It had been ascertained that the force which had occupied Grafton and had driven Porterfield from Philippi was part of an army commanded by Major General George B. McClellan, Lee's young associate of the Mexican War. The forces gathering at Chambersburg and manifestly intended for the occupation of the Valley of Virginia were under Major General Robert Patterson, now 69 years of age. Lee remembered him well, of course, as leader of a division of Scott's army at the Battle of Cerro Gordo. The largest army of all, mustering in Washington and on the south bank of the Potomac, had at its head Brigadier General Irvin McDowell, who, during the autumn of 1846, had been with Lee in the advance of General Wool's column. McClellan could march against Garnett and the head of the Shenandoah Valley, or he could, with equal readiness, reinforce Patterson in front of Harper's Ferry and at the lower end of the valley. Patterson, controlling the Central Army, could join either McClellan or McDowell. In front of Manassas Junction, McDowell might crush Beauregard or, if bold, might extend his right wing and unite in joint operations with Patterson. The general plan of the Federals, as seen from Richmond, was well conceived and was to be undertaken where the presence of mountains and the absence of railroads would deprive the Confederates of much of the advantage of the inner lines. The next move on this long northern and western front came at Harper's Ferry, where General Johnston continued as pessimistic as ever of his prospects, though the administration again assured him of its desire to hold the place as long as practicable. On June 13, the Federals made a raid on Romney, 55 miles west of Harper's Ferry. The troops engaged in this advance belonged to Patterson's army and they returned quickly into Maryland, but they were assumed by Johnston to be the vanguard of McClellan's forces, moving to a junction with Patterson. Johnston accordingly evacuated Harper's Ferry and took position at Bunker Hill, 12 miles from Winchester on the main road from Hagerstown into the valley. The want of ammunition, he explained, has rendered me very timid. From that locality he carried on a lively correspondence with the War Department, he anxious to get more men, more ammunition, additional cavalry support, and better officers, the President very insistent that the valley be not exposed to a federal advance, and that Johnston remain where he could cooperate quickly with Beauregard in case either his command or the army at Manassas Junction was attacked by superior forces. On July 2, General Patterson crossed the Potomac and on the 3D drove in Johnston's outposts and occupied Martinsburg. There he halted, and there he stayed. Daily expecting an attack, Johnston called out two brigades of militia and asked for the loan of 6,000 or 7,000 men from Beauregard's army. Johnston was then of opinion that Patterson was receiving 700 to 800 reinforcements and he had no intimation of the fact that Patterson actually was threatened with the loss of a large part of his command because of the expiration of the term of enlistment of many 90-day volunteers. Davis, in reply to Johnston's request for more men, listed the calls being made for troops at Norfolk, on the peninsula, at Manassas, and in western Virginia, and once more explained to Johnston how the whole of the Shenandoah Valley would be exposed and the army cut off from Richmond if Patterson were not halted. In this correspondence with Johnston, Lee had little part, for Johnston seemed resentful of orders from Lee and was inclined to be censorious in his dealings with him.
Meantime, the situation in northwestern Virginia grew ominous. Prior to the surprise of Porterfield's force at Philippi on June 3, Lee had frankly stated that the situation in front of Manassas Gap and elsewhere in Virginia was such that he could not do more to support the force in the northwestern part of the state than to forward arms and to authorize the raising of volunteers. After Porterfield had been driven out and Garnett had been sent to relieve him, Lee forwarded three regiments of infantry for Garnett's immediate reinforcement. Other troops were to be sent as soon as available. Garnett had studied the situation closely and had reported that the enemy showed no disposition to advance beyond Philippi. Beyond that point the Federals were not known to be in great force. In every other respect the situation had been discouraging. On his arrival at Huttonsville, 31 miles south of Philippi on June 14, Garnett had found only 23 companies of infantry, and these, he had reported, were in a miserable condition as to arms, clothing, equipment, instruction and discipline. Still, he had regimented these troops immediately, had pushed forward with them, and, with a single battery, had occupied the passes on Rich Mountain and Laurel Hill. These were considered the most important positions in that part of the Commonwealth, because they were crossed by the main highways leading from the Baltimore and Ohio. When Garnett, on June 25, had forwarded his first detailed report to Lee, explaining his difficulties, he had stated that the majority of the people were opposed to the South and that it was almost impossible to get accurate information concerning the position of the enemy. He had discussed, however, the possibilities of attacking and destroying the Cheat River Bridge on the Baltimore and Ohio, 50 miles away, and had seemed in no wise alarmed at the outlook. By July 1, his little force had not mounted above 4,500 effectives, and Garnett had felt compelled to ask for further reinforcements. Only 23 volunteers had come in, he had said, no hope could be entertained of any real accretion of strength from the country roundabout. If he was to hold the passes he had to keep 2,000 men there, and this reduced his mobile force to 2,500. Some help might be afforded, he had thought, if General Wise, who had been in the Valley of the Kanawha with a newly formed legion, would march against Parkersburg. Before the receipt of this appeal Lee sent one more regiment to Garnett, and on hearing more fully of the situation he had directed two others to be forwarded under the command of able professional soldiers. After fortifying the mountain passes Garnett underwent a change of opinion as to the outlook. On July 5, he reported that he did not believe the enemy would attack him, primarily because he supposed the Federals had occupied as much of northwest Virginia as they could want. He questioned whether it was worthwhile to maintain a large force where its function would inevitably be negative, inasmuch as there was no probability that he would have enough men at his disposal to assume the offensive. Lee did not take this optimistic view. I do not think it probable, he wrote on receipt of Garnett's dispatch, that the enemy will confine himself to that portion of the northwest country which he now holds, but, if he can drive you back, will endeavor to penetrate as far as Staunton. Your object will be to prevent him, if possible, and to restrict his limits within the narrowest range, which, although outnumbered, it is hoped by skill and boldness you will accomplish. This warning never reached Garnett. Two days before it was written General McClellan arrived in front of Rich Mountain. His communications were well covered by an ample force, and his dispositions were admirably made. The absence of anything even approaching an intelligence service on the Confederate side enabled McClellan to advance with all the elements of surprise. Rich Mountain Pass was defended by a small force under Lt. Col. John Pegram. Garnett held the pass to the northward on Laurel Hill. Deliberately employing the strategy that Lee had helped to develop in Mexico, McClellan planned and executed another Cerro Gordo. General W. S. Rosecrans found another unguarded path to the crest of Rich Mountain, stormed the battery there on July 11 and opened the road for McClellan, who advanced rapidly to Beverly on the 12th. Garnett, finding his flank turned by the capture of Rich Mountain, attempted to withdraw from Laurel Hill, but was pursued. In a rearguard action on the 13th, he was cut off and killed at Carrick's Ford, on Shiver's Fork of Cheat River. Pegram and part of his command were captured the same day. The remainder of his force precipitately withdrew over successive strong positions to Monterey, 35 miles southeast of Beverly. The defeat was complete and might have been serious if McClellan had pursued, for Monterey was only some 20 miles from the railroad that led directly to Staunton, which was itself distant by road about 40 miles from Monterey.
Three days' hard marching might have carried McClellan to the heart of the Shenandoah Valley. No serious resistance could have been offered. The Confederate casualties had not fallen much short of 1,000, and most of the survivors were demoralized and scattered. General Scott, however, had been afraid McClellan would outrun his communications and had cautioned him against advancing too far. McClellan obeyed orders. First news of the disaster reached Richmond on July 14 and created the greater distress because troops from the capital had been engaged in the operations. The extent of the reverse was magnified by McClellan's rhetorical congratulations to his troops. Most Southerners believed the triumph of Northern arms as great as McClellan represented it. Lee's first move was to urge that the strong position at Cheat Mountain, five miles in rear of Beverly, should be held, not knowing that it had already been evacuated. His next step was to order the quasi-independent columns of Wise and Floyd to support the defeated Little Army. Thereafter he hurried troops forward and placed General W. W. Loring in temporary command, with instructions to cling to the mountain passes, to protect the railroad, and to organize a counter-offensive as soon as he thought proper. Lee had overtaxed even his iron endurance during the strains of those difficult July weeks, but he would have gone at once in person to attempt to redeem the evil day had not President Davis desired him to remain in Richmond, in view of the imminence of a hard battle in front of Manassas. On that sector Beauregard had been receiving further reinforcements and had organized his forces into brigades, which, unknown to President Davis, he had placed somewhat in advance of the position that Lee had selected for defense. On July 14, the very day that the first reports of Garnett's defeat had reached Richmond, James Chestnut, Jr., a South Carolina member of the Confederate Congress, came down from Manassas with a plan for the consideration of Mr. Davis. The president was sick with one of the recurring attacks that almost blinded and paralyzed him, but he immediately called a conference to which he summoned General Lee and Adjutant General Cooper. When they came together, in the parlor of the Spotswood Hotel, Mr. Chestnut proceeded to outline, from brief notes, a grandiose strategic plan that Beauregard had directed him to submit for approval. Beauregard, he said, was of opinion that the Federals would have two lines of advance southward from the Washington defenses, one to threaten the force at Manassas, and the other to cut the communications with Johnston. That done, the Federals would be able to force Beauregard to fight at a disadvantage. Consequently, Beauregard proposed that Johnston should lend him 20,000 troops, with which force he would attack and defeat McDowell in front of Fairfax Courthouse. Next, he would detach 10,000 of his men to reinforce Johnston in overwhelming Patterson near Winchester. With Patterson destroyed, Garnett would be given sufficient troops to crush McClellan. Then Johnston and Garnett would march into Maryland and attack Washington from the rear, while Beauregard assailed the capital from the south. Davis and Lee opposed this plan on obvious grounds, it involved impossible concentration, it assumed Garnett and Johnston were much stronger than they actually were, it took for granted that the enemy would fight a superior force in front of Washington instead of retiring within the fortifications of the city, and, finally, it postulated a continuing offensive power the Confederate forces would not possess after so much marching and fighting. The whole scheme was so impractical that probably neither the president nor Lee would have remembered it had not Beauregard subsequently brought it up in his report on First Manassas. In discussing the situation, however, Davis and Lee again considered the plan previously formulated for coordinated action by Beauregard and Johnston. At the time of the conference, the president did not consider that McDowell had sufficiently developed his purpose to justify an order for Johnston's withdrawal from the valley. The blow, as he then saw the situation, might as readily fall in the valley as at Manassas. The practical and all-important problem was that of so timing the march of Beauregard or of Johnston as the offensive might require, as not to jeopardize the other. What followed was under the personal direction of the president, rather than of Lee. On the 17th, Beauregard reported his outposts attacked and called for reinforcements from Johnston and also from General T. H. Holmes, who was commanding at Fredericksburg. Davis promptly ordered Johnston to go to Beauregard's help, if practicable. Receiving this order at 1 a.m. on July 18, Johnston set out as soon as he could dispose of his sick, and at noon on the 20th arrived at Manassas with the van of his army. Meantime, from Richmond and from Lynchburg every company that the railroads could transport was hurried forward by Davis.
It was currently believed in the capital that the last disposable troops around the city had been moved to the front where, by this time, the whole South knew the first great battle of the war was about to be fought. Lee's anxiety over the situation was apparent to all his visitors. He of course wished to go to Manassas, but Davis considered it more important that he remain in Richmond. On Sunday morning, July 21, a very clear and mild day, President Davis found himself unable to endure the inaction he felt compelled to enjoin upon Lee. Taking a special train for the scene of the battle he left Lee to wait and to agonize. Private messages received during the forenoon told of minor advantages on either side. Then came several hours without authentic news when rumor did its worst with wild tales of Confederate debacle and a victorious federal march on Richmond. After dark fell, the official dispatches began to trickle in. Presently this one arrived. Manassas, July 21, 1861. We have won a glorious though dear-bought victory. Night closed on the enemy in full flight and closely pursued. Jefferson Davis. All the suspense of a frantic city broke into wild rejoicing at this news, only to be checked quickly by consciousness of heavy losses and curiosity for more details. By midnight Lee knew, and all Richmond knew, that after the battle had virtually been lost, the last belated units of Johnston's force had arrived on the overtaxed little railroad, had rushed into action at the right moment on a wavering front, and had precipitated a federal retreat that soon became a mad rout. The first men to reach Richmond from Manassas, splashed and muddy hospital stewards and quartermaster's men, who wanted more stretchers and instruments, more tourniquets and stimulants, brought wild tales of carnage in the ranks and staggering losses in the high command. Richmond listened, wide-eyed and speechless. Only the sluggish could sleep while apprehension for the safety of sons and joy over the triumph of southern arms contested for the mastery of excited minds. The next day, rainy and with a heavy, cooling wind, brought more details of the victory, but only a few men came back from Manassas who had shared in the decisive phase of the battle. Not until nightfall did the president return, bringing with him the bodies of the leaders who had been killed in action. He spoke to the crowd from the Spotswood Hotel and described what had happened. An hour later, in a torrential rain, the first ambulance train rolled in with a groan, and Richmond came to herself, at last, in caring for the wounded. It was the first time in Lee's life that he had experienced the anguish of a battle from afar. His relief was greater, perhaps, and his emotions came more completely to the surface than in any other crisis of the war. I almost wept for joy, he wrote Johnston, at the glorious victory achieved by our brave troops. The feeling of my heart could hardly be repressed on learning the brilliant share you had in its achievement. To Beauregard he said, I cannot express the joy I feel at the brilliant victory of the 21st. The skill, courage, and endurance displayed by yourself excite my highest admiration. You and your troops have the gratitude of the whole country. To Mrs. Lee, he opened his heart. That indeed was a glorious victory and has lightened the pressure upon our front amazingly. Do not grieve for the brave dead. Sorrow for those they left behind, friends, relatives, and families. The former are at rest. The latter must suffer. The battle will be repeated there in greater force. I hope God will again smile on us and strengthen our hearts and arms. I wished to partake in the former struggle and am mortified at my absence, but the President thought it more important I should be here. I could not have done as well as has been done, but I could have helped and taken part in the struggle for my home and neighborhood. So the work is done, I care not by whom it is done. His part in the victory was hardly less than if he had been present. The combined forces of Beauregard and Johnston had included 41 full and two incomplete regiments and three battalions of infantry, two regiments, one battalion, and ten independent companies of cavalry, one battalion and nine separate batteries of light artillery, and one militia battalion with heavy artillery, a total of 35,207 men. Of this army, eight regiments of infantry, two regiments of cavalry, two incomplete regiments of infantry, six field batteries, the heavy artillery, and an indeterminable part of independent cavalry companies were Virginian. They constituted something more than a fourth of the army, and had, in every instance, been raised and put in the field under Lee's direction within less than three months.
General Early was within the facts, probably, when he stated eleven years afterwards, but for the capacity and energy displayed by General Lee in organizing and equipping troops to be sent to the front, our army would not have been in a condition to gain the first victory at Manassas. Lee was responsible, also, for the selection of the line taken up by Beauregard, and it had been his military judgment, together with that of General Koch, which had dictated the concentration at Manassas Junction. In large part, also, he fashioned the strategy of a junction between Johnston and Beauregard, though this was a move so manifestly desirable that it must have suggested itself to all who studied the situation in June and July. The doubtful consideration was not whether the one force should join the other, but when, and here it was the president who made the decision and consequently deserves the credit. The public, however, did not reflect on the preparation that had made victory possible. It saw only the victory itself and the men who had achieved it. Beauregard became as popular in Virginia as he had been in South Carolina or in Louisiana. Johnston took the place that Lee had occupied in the affection of Virginia people. The circumstances that had denied Lee a share in the Battle of Manassas, the very service that had given him such knowledge of the military situation as to make him indispensable in Richmond prior to the battle, now operated to lower his prestige. The next unlucky turn of the wheel was to destroy that prestige altogether and was to bring him an unpopularity that might readily have ended his military career before his great opportunity came. 